Aloha. So this is the second podcast for which was originally titled the Happy Hour Podcast, but uh, we've since migrated to the new name, which will be Grand Theft Audio. I'm not going to take credit for that. That was Kirker. Great wee idea there. So we'll be going with that uh, going forward. Um, uh, so two gremlins and machine recording this time. Uh, we use new software and myself and Phil were recording. Unfortunately, for some reason, none of my audio recorded. All of Phil's beside himself did. So unfortunately for this podcast, Phil's audio will be out of place, but we're going to work that kink out for the next edition. Um, and we're currently sussing it whether or not we will host one for uh, Easter weekend coming or whether or not we will just wait until the end of next month and keep it monthly as planned. See our friends go. So uh, yes, the topics this month were a bit of information on the vinyl for those interested. And the other was what bands you never understood the fascination for. A few interesting suggestions. And also the mystery album, as there was before. So if you're looking to you know expand your musical horizons, maybe pick up on a new band or artist or album, it's the place to be. So enjoy, have fun, take care. Two, one. You're live on Channel 4. Please don't say fuck or bugger. Uh, so, this is what I do for the guy. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> So, yes, this week's topic that we'll be discussing, there's going to be two, two topics. Ah, ah. So the first one is going to be covered by Dickie and Phil there. Um, they're going to be discussing vinyl, and then after that we're going to be focusing on bands or artists that you just don't get, that have all the fame in the world, but you just think they're shite, and why. Um, there was going to be two additional people, uh, Steve from Country and Fate from uh, the band that Clarence in, and also Gary from last time, but um, they had to duck this one last out. Last time? So. What, what have they gigged, exactly? Shit, man. <laughs> <laughs> Never heard of them. <laughs> you're going to get, you're going to get cancelled now. There's going to be a a, 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 t a Twitter hashtag, you know, kick off Contra and Fate, you know, all these people in Los Angeles and shit will be triggered by this. Um, I hope we get the ratings up. <laughs> Oh, but I did the album sales, I wonder, mate. Um, so, Phil, Kirker, you've got the floor. What would you like to discuss about vinyl? What would you like to sell? You know, why do you think people should invest in vinyl? I have no idea. I don't know vinyl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you, David. I've only had three hey, beers, like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you take the lead, Phil. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm, yeah. The blue red color, yeah. Nice. Yeah.
Yeah, I like I know. Obviously, it's going to be probably a lot more expensive than going to buy a CD. So I Definitely. think that that also shows a different level of commitment because what you're talking maybe an upwards of twenty to twenty five quid for a fairly common one, and then there was a few that you guys were linking in a chat that we were in, and there was some going into the limited pressings of a thousand copies that are worth like six hundred and shit, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's very easy to get carried away. Yeah, the only things that were like originally back in the 80s, everything were vinyl and then transitioned to CD. And I know it was banned CD because of Spotify, so they were back to banned vinyl. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And because of that, because the CDs are being sold, they're just jacking the price up on them. Ah. Uh, like I just said, it's like for an album, it's about 20, 30 quid for just a random album. Yeah. For anything. Yeah. Where I think. Used to buy a CD for a mm -hmm. Yeah. If you're lucky, if you went if you went to HMV or some shit, you know you tend to find that if you're into a niche music genre, the price goes up even more. Yeah. 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 In ten years' time, people will be forking out twenty quid to buy a cassette tape or something. A perny cassette's coming back. A perny cassette's what? coming back. How yeah. can it come back though? There's, there's a, there's a, there's a, another YouTube TV. Uh, there's another YouTube channel called Banger TV. So they focus on all um, metal releases. Now they have different reviewers, there may be about 10 or 12 different people, but there's like people that focus on, you know the way like in the 80s and the 90s, there was a big scene for, I found this really cool, but missing this whole era, was that during the 80s and 90s people swapped tapes. So the, you would join like a, like a fan scene or a magazine and say you lived in, you know, Los Angeles or you lived in Belfast, you could trade tapes with up and coming acts that were getting bigger in that time that had only recorded an album that, that had been pressed on a cassette and trade them overseas, do your own copy and trade back. So that was a way to discover new bands. I think that was pretty cool. But now, obviously, the convenience of the internet robbed that mystique a bit. The one thing. The one, mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, I mean, one thing I would say, like, I don't have vinyl, and I think, I would, I would, I think, um, I think I would give it a pop if I had room to set aside to it. I'm still, I'm still maximizing space in the house. Might happen someday, but I think the one thing that it seems to embody is that it focuses on the whole love of an album. You know, for the most part, see the majority of people that use Spotify. There's probably a good maybe 50 to 60 percent, if not more. People probably go to an artist to listen to singles or one or two particular songs. Whereas vinyl to me is probably more geared towards someone that loves an album. The concept of it, Definitely. you know, listening to an album. Like for me, so, like, for I, me bought all, I bought vinyls that I pretty much like every song on the album just because yeah. it's you can like skip through by moving the needle, but you just kind of don't want to. And uh, because you're spending so much money on them, you kind of like you want to make sure you like the whole album. Well, so, it's like, uh, that's like that's what like me and Carl were saying about the whole thing we said before about band and album. Now people feel less obliged to, and I think there's yeah. something to say about it as well. Um, that um, you bought a CD back in the day, and that cost you maybe twelve, or fourteen quid, maybe. You fucking made sure you enjoyed that. You give it a few spins to make sure whether or not you truly liked it or not. Because yeah. now you click an album on Spotify, listen to the first track for maybe thirty seconds to three minutes, and if it doesn't grab your attention, you you never listen to your game cards and on there. It's probably the same. You, you click an artist or a band, and just because it didn't cost you anything, you're like, ah, fuck it. But you might be missing out. Spotify's done an amazing thing in the sense of. I know a lot of the bands got at the market and the idea when you know these sort of sites like Deezer and stuff and Spotify popped up but it's allowed 
unknown bands to surface into the market, which uh-huh. they wouldn't have before because it was obviously monopolized by bigger bands. If you're a local band, you had no chance getting in. So Spotify oh, is a thing where it's allowed little bands to get in there. However, and the flip side of it is you have to feed through more um, shit, you know, because if you're into some one drama, for example, prog music, finding a a prog band nowadays with a long lasting impression is very hard because mm-hmm. the majority of them when you listen to the first song, you're like, I know exactly what you're gonna be. You're gonna you're gonna be exactly how I visioned the first song. You go to third, fourth, fifth song, and it is and then you just flick through it again, you know? It's, where if you do buy an album, having a sleeve, you know, that's why a lot of people go for um vinyls because it's a sleeve. You know, you can get into the concept of the album possibly, um, if you're interested in the lyrics, that kind of thing. Um, other than that, for me, yep. vinyl is a a, 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 a a giant frisbee, and uh, if you want the sort of good quality audio, just get it in WAV format. I think depending on some artists, though, the the music might not be, let's say, up to scratch in people's views, but <laughs> the artwork of the album could be something just to behold. Yeah, I I yeah. think. Artwork, artwork does actually influence. I don't know about you, but there's sometimes seeing the front cover of an album for some reason would gear you more to actually hitting the play. Definitely. Oh, why? <clears throat> it's it adds, static of running vinyl. Oh, why? It adds to it. Adds to the. It's like you know, even if you see a song and uh, the song has a title. That never gets mentioned in the song, but maybe the song the song title gives some sort of foundation for the lyrics that it suddenly all makes sense, and you're like, "Fuck, that's clever!" Stuff like that. We mind yeah. details. And they've got a signature artwork. Yeah. <clears throat> would definitely add to the effect of people on hallucinogenics as well, I'd say. <laughs> especially especially in the, like, the desert rock scene, that would be like some kind of cactus has come to life. Yeah, pe- some peyote uh, <laughs> and psychedelic colors, you know, that go hand in hand. Um, and play the school play the school. Yeah, yeah. I'll be honest. It, it, but then it's like you say. Like I know we're getting totally off topic about vinyl, but like certain things complement each other. Like like you say, the the kaleidoscope thing. Having imagery like that for a black metal band would just be you'd be going, well, it, it doesn't go. You know, all these happy colours and shit, and someone's green. I you're just like, what's going on? Um, so now that we've covered the first topic, we'll move on to the next one then. Um, that one with regards to, pardon me, um, uh, bands or artists that you feel give more credit than what they're due. You know, <clears throat> if you have one or two here, if you want to go off in a run, now's your chance. I have one in particular, and I'm not going to say until it comes around to my turn, so... Kirker's the first in my row, so Kirker, if you've got two or three bands that you want to rant about and have other people try and convince you otherwise. Well, in fairness, I have lots of bands I want to rant about, but... Well, you have bands to with that. If it's bands that you don't, like, I don't get, I don't understand the big deal about. Okay. I really... They have, I like some of their songs. That's, that's what, what band did you say? I want band and yeah. catch on there. Tool. Tool. Like like Dickies. I don't get what the big massive deal is about them. <clears throat> Somebody explain to me what the big deal is about them. I'll be honest, uh, man. My, my, my partner, I think, is a big, big fan of um, Tool. And um, for, for me, like, I, I'll be the first to admit, as much as I do think they're a fascinating band, I haven't gotten into them as much as other people, but I do see the appeal. But... Um, I mean, the music's consistent. I mean, I um, think the bands of two try to sort of pose you across this and like, you know, the music's, everything's so different, but it, they have got a two sound. I think that's why they're 
the popular for it, you know, along with that as well as along with their abstract art, it attracts artsy people as well, um, potentially into the mix, which I think. But certainly, I mean, Tool does have a sound, and from album to album, I know people argue that they do sound different. I don't think so. I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but I do think that's one of the massive things why, why people like Tool, because they do claim that it's, you know, every album's very different. I, I think that I will, I will say, on the grand scheme of things, you know, and some people could argue in terms of progressive bands, you could argue, for the most part, Tool is quite simplistic compared to some prog, racking, some prog metal bands. But when you look at how their songs build up, it's very well done. But that's, it's, that's, it's that's more the drums. That's a good thing, probably, because the modern day prog is kind of ruined things a wee bit where yeah, yeah. it is going out the sort of out of, of, it, out of its way to be awkward almost uh, but they've forgotten about the composition of music they've forgotten about a lovely melody like for example a lot of prog bands out there are very technical technically um uh what's the word for it? technically they're they're singer some of them they're saying is don't know how to get around that kind of music and can't make interesting melodies and there's no hook for example perfect circle um you know one of the most famous songs i can't remember the name of the song now what's the the video where they're all on the phones uh you'll not run could be well, that two it was the, it, it was one of the early ones all on their phones yeah must the be a recent one I don't know <coughs> it, is, <coughs> it is one of the recent ones well that song there with a pro right the whole song the whole way through People argue it is a drum. It's a straight sound. There's no change in tempo, change in melodies. And what is black and white? Um, it's often on. There's a girl on her phone and she's looking around and everyone else is on her phone. Um, I think plays a lot. I can't remember the name of the song, but um, that's a prime example of a song where it, it's done right. Where the whole song is pretty much a drum. The verse and chorus are very similar, right? Nothing changes. You wouldn't really sort of argue and say, well, that, that's that's prog. However, it's wee slight hooks. You know, there's a four-second vocal hook, and that's it. The rest of the vocals are quite droney and boring, but there's a four-second vocal hook that keeps you coming back. And the, the melody is basically, na, 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 na. And then it goes back to straight vocals. But that wee bit is what your brain's twigging onto, and that's what makes you, you know, sticking for it. You're waiting for that melody to come up again. And I think that's what prog kind of missed. Then we hooks. It may only be three seconds in a song every th verse, but that's the wee bits people miss. See prog where it's trying to be every bit's completely different. The brain is not really developed to sort of catch on to things like that. And um, it's it's good if you're into jazz, it's into sort of white green music on a saxophone, but the majority of people aren't. It's not going to have a lasting impression on them. That's what I mean. Unless you I, think, I, think, I think in terms of modern prog, the trap that a lot of bands fall into, I don't know if you <clears throat> guys listening to it, but it tends to be they'll, they'll play a seven or eight string and they'll stick to that. Meanwhile, another guitarist puts on delay and reverb and goes ding! Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and the top string, and that's really it. Um, yeah. You're right, very production driven, and then the artwork yeah. is really over the top. The artwork is usually amazing looking mm. to sort of try to match it, but I don't know. It There's just... the, the prop. Mm -hmm. No, I was gonna say, you know, I think, I think like the way Kirk was saying, he doesn't get it. I would say maybe part of that would maybe come from because of the fact that there's super two fans, you know, the fucking proper eccentric types that are like, you know, that. That are heterosexual, but if men are James Keenan wanted to put his willy in their bum, that happily accept. Um, there is a, there is a lot of it. You know, you know what I mean. There's, there's, they, they are, they are clever. Like their lyrical themes and the structures, of the songs, like that whole thing with, um, oh, you know, lateralist, the way it was written to the Fibonacci's, you know, time signature. You know that that's meant to represent a circle, and. Because you no, know, sorry, a sparrow. Because the song's all about a sparrow, and um, some people have said that's pretentious, but some people say it's clever. You know. Hi. Hi. Hello. <laughs>
Oh yeah. They're, they're a gateway bun. <clears throat> Yeah. Welcome back. <laughs> so, okay. well, I think another thing as well too is there are a band that, that open up to so much interpretation. You know, mm. writing music. You know, Ryan will tell you. You know, it. A lot of people like to sort of attribute that sort of sometimes musicians and artists are very clever with the lyrics and they're they're trying to they're playing five D chess with you almost that they're meaning something that. You know, it's completely above you, and people try to decode that, like Da Vinci's Code. Really, musicians and artists sometimes write lyrics just to go with the music. They don't really know what it means, and people sort of think really deep into it. The good thing with Tool is they have abstract videos and weird lyrics to go with that, which people can interpret it and interpret it into maybe the, you know, thinking that Tool members are sort of attributing a deeper meaning to it. Where really, sometimes it might just be fucking with you, you know. And a lot of artists like awesome. I just. I listen to bands all the time and you know if you go into forums people think that their their lyrics are trying to say some sort of backhanded thing where in reality you know it's like steve wilson said you know when he's writing lyrics he sometimes writes random words and then a month or two later he goes back and listens to the song and then the, the lyrics themselves tell him what he was feeling at that time but he's not going out of his way to try to do something really really yeah. clever and the majority of bands aren't because it's hard to get clever lyrics over music you're just gonna go with whatever lyrics fit the music at the time. So non-artist musicians do a tribute, you know, do like to sort of put their their preferred artists in a pedestal that way. Um, and I think that's a good thing too, because you've got the abstract art to go with it, people can kind of attribute how it means. It's like a package. Yeah. And it puts you down a rabbit hole, you know, not only can you get behind the music, you can get behind the art and you can get behind the meaning. It's like a pyramid. Oh. Sex. I, yeah. You, yeah, you saying about that, I'll be honest, the first time I heard two was the song Stink Fist. And I'd seen a Skirker, do you remember MTV2? The good old yeah, guys? Yeah. The headbangers ball. Yes, MTV2 had, that was some exposure to some real wacky bands. I was the first time seeing System of a Down and stuff on that. But Stink Fist was the first video of theirs I saw. I remember at the time going, what the fuck is this? Because all their videos, the majority of them, they never appear in. It's some sort of weird. It's Adam. Which it's like uh, Adam Jones designs. Also, he did. I he did this. He did the special effects for Terminator Two, and I'm guessing other films as well. Because I'm guessing they don't just stop some random guy on the screen going. Just do special effects for Blockbuster. Aye. Um. So, yeah, all their videos were always these weird monsters or weird stop motion play things or aliens and you were like okay this is weird this is like a weird short animation with a song behind it but yeah that always piqued my interest but like Karn said about the whole deeper meaning thing stink fist it's effectively when you analyze the song they're using the analogy of fisting to explain the human condition that the more you get like like alcohol when you're 18 or 17 or 13, if you're from Bally Duff, you, you know, you drink your first beer, you get pissed after one or two, you get older, that becomes harder to see it. And that's true about the human condition. I suppose that's like how people end up on heroin. I don't know. What now? Don't have any holes in my arms. Um, but, uh, I, have I have nothing against him. I have nothing against them. They you just don't get the magic. I, like. I just don't get what the massive hype is about. Yeah. Do you like, like, do you listen to them though? Do you like them? What yeah, I'm I'm sure. Sure. Well, like, Sober is my favorite song. So I love Skate. Yeah. I love the bass for Yeah, like Shizzle was the first song I ever heard. And I think it might have been on a Guitar Hero as well. I played it and I was I really loved it and started going, okay. Normally I sort of go and look and and all, but. Because uh, they only had about six music videos at the time, I went through and just watched them. So for ages, I only watched six music videos, and that was it. That was all the tool I was really getting into. But then later down the years, I actually started listening to more. I was like, you know what, I like them songs, I'll go listen to discography. I would say there's a ton of shit in it, because it's all this ambient stuff that's just noise. I don't personally like that. I don't know anyone who does but i'm sure there are people 
that's the only bad thing about getting their vinyls is in you do listen to that through it. Maybe it'll sound better to some people, but I just sort of listen to just their music songs or tracks and forget about their ambient stuff because that's not for me. We don't have that problem, as uh, Card could attest to. Well. They'll have at least one track per album where you're like, they just got a hold of a load of drugs and just. I, I don't even, from a from the music making perspective, I'm like, I don't even know how that the some of these songs came about. Um, where you're just like, no idea what the fuck this is meant to be, but it breaks up the songs. That's the only yeah. thing I can say. Ambient yeah. is a very specific music. Some ambient's lovely. Um, you know, some I, is. like Devin Townsend's ghost album. Also, well, yeah. Devin's Devin's ghost album. You know, there's ambient parts. It's mostly considered folk. It's the reverb. Oh. Devin did a proper ambient album, which was the Hummer. Devin oh, Hummer, Hummer as well. Which is it? You know, if you're not into ambient, you know that would be a prime example of ambient music. Where it would be hard to get into. Um, and then you have the likes of uh, Pink Floyd's Relics would be considered ambient as well. Um, so proper ambient music can be hard to get into. However, um, it is that it is hard to get into. Um, it's not a particularly hard genre to write because it's electronic. You know, a lot of it's just pre-programmed synths that you could sort of echo on to. Um, but yeah, I mean, for me, I, I like the, the the meditation ambient. You know, where you go onto YouTube and you, it's four hour galaxy still with ambient music playing in the background. I actually think yeah. that kind. Of, I actually think that kind of music would be maybe tricky to write because you could sort of stay consistent and maybe have a slight up build and a gradual change. If you listen but, to the meditation one, it's 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 not the case though. I mean, a lot of it's just drone keyboard, so it's. You can tell it's from a synth mm. preset, uh, you know, and it's done, yeah. you know, unless you're being really abstract with it. But then again, it is just getting a bunch of sounds and putting them together. You don't need to, the, the, you don't need to worry about much about keys, melodies. I mean, you know, so yeah. not that not to be bad about it, you know, some of it can really tick your brain like it's it's great, but um, ultimately that's I mean, that's what it is, you know. I kind of get this image of like Ross from Friends with his soundscapes on his keyboard. Yeah. You don't like the meta. That, that's what a lot of it is. Though. Yeah. You know? But that's uh, awesome. uh, So we've done, with, well, Kirker, is that who your, your nomination is and you're happy to stick with them? As in, like, I, you're... I mean, there's another one. I mean, I, I don't like Megadeth, but that's purely because I like, get deal with his voice. That's, that's, that's a, it's hard that's to like. Example. That's the only reason. You know, I musically, I, you know, I'll be honest, I like Megadeth, but I can see where you're coming from yeah. because Dean Mustaine to me does have a weird voice as far as thrash metal goes. Right. A lot so of like, everything go forward placed when he sings. It's like in his nose. Yeah, it's, everything goes through his nose. He's it, singing it's, his nose. It's more like, you know what it is? The majority of, you know, thrash is. <laughs> Or it's, you know, bordering on, like, shouty growl. I'm not going to do it because Maggie's asleep. But, but like, <laughs> Dave Mistain, Dave Mistain at times sounds like he's just step in something soggy. No, wait, ah! You know, he's just... <laughs> he, he, but in saying that, though, there's some songs he does use his voice well. Like, not, you know, not to go for an obvious choice, but, like, sweating bullets. That song shouldn't work, but you know, hello me, meet the real me. Um, it suits the lyrics, but yeah, I know what you mean. He's definitely an acquired taste. It's almost like his voice is that sort of distinct and easily it becomes another instrument apart from the guitar. <laughs> you know what? See what you've actually said. That is what I say to people to get how to get into things like death metal and black metal. They'll hear the vocals yeah, and they instantly so. go, and I say, treat it as another instrument that just treat it as like another bass instrument and just that has a rhythmical pattern and you'll you'll learn to appreciate it over time. I used to hate it, but now I love it. Um, you know, Carlos, uh, yeah. what would be your vote? I, I think in particular Carl has traits in music that I know he hates, but I'm curious to see. I, 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 I can name one that I know Carl detests. Shoot, he hates, go ahead. He hates whenever a band has what he would call like a forced accent. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I can't think of any, I'll be honest, I, I can't think of any bands off the bat here. Um, but I mean, <laughs> I mean, de definitely. I mean, there, there's traits I don't like. There, there's there there are new traits though. It's more the modern bands now. For example, there's a the, the modernized rock trait now that a lot of bands do is where you have a male vocalist that puts on a low vocal, and you can tell it's deliberate. You know, it's I'm almost sure like the vocal. Now the Volbeat one works, but it's almost as if Volbeat has kind of gave them people an idea, and it's always a guy with a sort of a big bushy beard, and he goes. Hur, 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 hur. And he puts on the voice. That's, that's pretty annoying because it's, it's put on and it's almost the, the mask your natural voice. You know, we don't hear many vocalists these days with like distinct vocals. Just natural tone? Where it's like, I know exactly who that guy is, you know. And if he starts another song, you know exactly who he is. Now it's almost very forced where they deliberately put on that low southern rock voice. Her, that's, her. Yeah, for me, um, it's it's just it's it's too paranoid now. It's too many people doing it, and it's uh, yeah, you, you're acting something you're not. I and mean, the good thing about a vocalist is is that you may not be the strongest vocalist in the world, vibrato wise or range wise, but if you have a distinctive tone, which is your natural voice, which makes it good. I mean, Joe Bonamass is the prime example here. Um, you know, he got a vocal coach, and yeah. vocal coach would always tell him is you know use your own voice. You know, stop trying to sing like someone else. Uh, and you know, Joe Bonamassa is not the strongest singer, but distinctive voice, which works. Uh, yeah, me. yeah, I I would say that's true about him. He, he yeah, like he, in terms of range, like he's not going to be going, <laughs> but he he's consistent, and you know his voice when you hear it straight away. When you hear his voice, you know it's his song. Yeah, I mean, put him against other vocalists, you would argue he's a poor vocalist, actually, <clears throat> but it doesn't matter because the vocalist, the vocals are it's his tone and. It, Suits his music, you know. You, you say Joe Bonamassa, you think of his tone and his voice, you know. Yeah. Exactly. Where a lot of rock bands, modern ones anyway, that low vocal, I could t I could name ten other bands with the exact same vocal approach. It's uh -huh. Can potentially segue into a different sort of direction here. The albums that we were talking about and how do we listen to you to see what we think of them? I found with one which was the Orbiculture band. The front man, as much as they were great, he was like metal James Hetfield. He That's was just true. very proper head. It was like Hetfield and Gujira. Like I, I'll, whenever we go on to that, I'll I'll tell you the bands that I heard from them, and I I would agree that was one I heard. So like that, but like I met Gujira, but again, there's a lot of stuff. His clean vocals, especially, were very. I was waiting for the big yeah, yeah, every other, yeah. Every other three minutes. Yeah, yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. So, but yeah, yeah. I mean, the student officer, I mean, the student officer, they're probably going to sue us after this. <laughs> so, Carl, you're that's that you happy with your venting, or is there anything else that came to mind that you'd go, I hate these fuckers? I, I really can't think of a, of a popular band right now off the top of my head that, um, I just don't get, and there is the horror load out there, but I just, there's not one I hear that much that I've made a note of, you know, like, I just move on and just like, <laughs> dig what I dig. Like, the only, the only, the only one, last one I can remember you having a slight criticism was with Zee Leonardo, that you really <laughs> like the soul side, but just, you don't think the black metal side's necessary? That's one, I suppose. No, it, it, it's unique, um, but... Um. I don't know. The, the first sound of Zealand Art, what I got was it was, it was, and this, a lot of people are going to disagree with me, and that's fine, but it was almost as if that he was trying to go, right, what is, what has no one done yet? Soul and black metal. You know, and that's not necessarily a good thing. It's not necessarily good to sort of just find something that no one else has done before and run with it. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, for me, anyway, it's because it might not work, but obviously it's worked for a lot of people. It's just for me, um, I just think when it gets into black metal, but it's it's did, black metal. Black, black, black metal by nature can be quite messy, you know. Did, unless you're like Ishan or you're pushing out the boundaries, like Old Man's Child or Demi Borger. But you know, Zillinara goes towards the more older school of black metal. Um, but 
I suppose I just like the soul side and I just want to hear more of that. And um, it was unique enough. I think it's unique enough with just the soul side. It's got a unique production. It kind of reminds you of the, the Black South. Mountain, you know, and the South, yeah. South. Yeah. Um, I've known some that before. If he kept it there, but then again, I suppose he suppose he would have had a completely different fan base, probably. Apparently, did I ever tell you the story about how he combined those genres? Hmm? Apparently. Oh, well, I was, I'm obviously going to suppress some of the words used in how, because, Phil, you already know. Uh, he. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This yeah, was yeah, very hell, careful. Yeah. yeah, this isn't a hill. Um, so, for people that don't know, Zealand Order combines. And Kirk, I don't know if you listen to them properly, but they're a combination of sort of, you would say, soul, gospel, blues. You know, it it carries off like, you know, the sort of music you'd hear in Oh Brother or Word of Thine. You know, you know, songs that were written during the slave, the slave era, but combined yeah. with black metal. So a bit of a contrast. It's funny, soulful, you associate with Christianity and all that. And the stark contrast of anti Christianity with black metal. Um, but I know what I'm going to have it on a playlist somewhere. And the first thing that I thought, it starts off, it's very loose, Ship on Fire. The song. first thing I thought of, the first thing I thought of when I heard it was Gary Clark Jr. Aye, aye, the, he does, yeah, he does have the sound. The Never could have. Uh, sort of start it. Yeah. At that album as a whole, to me, I can't fault that was probably like one of my top albums of two years ago. But he came up with this that band because he went out. He was trying to get ideas for a music project, and he has a bird pop on called Bird Mask. But he went on to 4chan and he said, "Um, people give me a suggestion for combining two unlikely genres, and someone put a and quote." They say black metal and N music. So okay. I'll let you fill in the rest there. So that's how he decided to combine those genres together. And I'm glad that he did. But I hear um, like new Nigerian music in this whatsoever. <laughs> but yeah, I, if I ever get the chance to see them live, I'm definitely doing it because I love the first two albums. The EP's okay. There's, a, there's one or two songs. The thing that surprised me more at them was the fact that they're he's Swiss. Oh, yeah, Did yeah. Not that. <laughs> yeah, he's Swiss. Did not and he, that at all. Yeah, he's Swiss and he moved to New York and his mom's a classically trained pianist, from what I remember, Reed. Uh, oh, cool. I'll put that. I've heard like a small handful of songs, and from what I have heard, I quite like. I haven't yeah. delved into um, that realm and stuff, but it's on the list. Oh, I. Who knows? I may pick it up some way. Uh, Dicky, you've got your soapbox. So, the one that I do not get is Kiss. <laughs> I just don't get it. Why they're so big? Why they're so popular? It's like, what made them so big? Was it the makeup and all? Like, if they didn't have the makeup, would they still be as big, mm. popular, and all? Yeah, um, probably right, yeah. I think uh, also you have a problem with Jews, though, so it's probably something to do with it. Are they Jewish? <laughs> yeah, yeah, Gene Simmons. Gene? Gene Simmons is Jewish. I didn't even know that. I, I well, just don't like him. He's gone off the rails and slabbering about everyone in the music. Oh, well, sure. He's a nut. He, he, apparently, Gene Simmons takes credit for anything. I think there's maybe a video somewhere of Ronnie James Dio saying that. Gene Simmons would would actually took credit for orange juice. I, I don't know if that's true or if that was just Ronnie James. It pro probably he would have. But yeah. um, uh, I know. I, I yeah, I would say that's a that's a good statement. They're everywhere as well. So like uh, they're in movies, like uh, role models movie. They all dress up at the end for the role playing. They're in Tony Hawk's Underground. I think one at the end. There's like a hidden level where it's just a Kiss concert. They're just everywhere in pop culture, and it just seems like they made it bigger than most other bands around the same time. I suppose Iron Maiden is probably up there with being so popular, but like they, you still don't see Iron Maiden in uh, all the movies and games and stuff as much as Kiss. And 
I think Kiss did uh, was also one of the first metal bands to have their own pinball machine. So uh, yeah. I don't know. It just had everything memorabilia wise was Kiss. I just I don't get it. I don't get why they're so big. I just there's just nothing special to me. Yeah, a merch. Yeah, merch. Yeah, well, they definitely are brand. Yeah. Hey, well, see, to be fair, there's a lot of people that do not like metal that know exactly who Eddie is, mainly because of the trooper album but yeah. uh yeah like uh, maybe to do with brandon then just they made a franchise rather than just a band but like yeah, I, I, brandon, yeah. it's definitely brandon. there's also a small chance that the likes of any company there could have says to earn about brandon eddie as their go forward and pinball machines and your well they do have yeah. pinball yeah. machines yeah. now yeah. aren't made past yeah. them yeah, the yeah. yeah. Like, the money that was made from kissing them yeah <laughs> It's funny, funny he's mentioned it though as well. When you think about, there's quite a lot of popular bands that have like either mascots or they have a particular look. You know, look at Slipknot. Yeah. And Gwar. And Gwar. Gwar. Yeah. Um, Ghost is the newest, is the closest, most recent one. That you could say it's got the whole look thing to sort of get the attention of people as well. Yeah, but they uh, constantly evolve. Like the their oh, yeah, yeah. Your name for best. He constantly yeah. changes the top of some artists every sort of album or two. I love I love the fact though that they actually play off that. That's um, marketing. They're part in it. They're part in it in this in essence, you know what I mean? Um and you know what? I know like that that could be a topic in itself and I'll probably bring it up again. You could focus on the most divisive bands that you can think of. Ghost is probably one of the most divisive metal bands now in terms of they completely divide people. It's either the people that really, really like them or the people that really don't like them. And but you tend to find that the people that don't like them use that. It's it's like the fucking carbon copy. You know, like when a conspiracy theorist says, think for yourself, sheeple. You tend to get people do that with ghost, but insert that comment of Scooby Doo music, which I I don't get because a few songs have organs in them. The majority ghosts actually have a fairly unique a, a fairly unique sound. I know you could say, oh, it's just seventies rock, but a bit creepy. But they're memorable songs. Yeah, you know, I think they have a really good song. They've got they've got good hooks, and you know, there's a lot of metal bands with kill that have that consistency in terms of memorable hooky songs. I heard somebody say before that uh, Ghost reminded them as if uh, Black Sabbath and Deep Purple had a baby. Yeah, that's a that is a good comparison, like, and maybe a bit of Blue Oyster Cult. Mm. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. Um. So that's Dickies. Mine. Um. Mine. I don't know whether or not it would ruffle a few feathers. And um, Steve Laguerre, he actually mentioned this one as well. I think Led Zeppelin. Oh, I thought Steve Laguerre was your issue. <laughs> was yeah, sad, like... yeah, Steve, <laughs> fuck you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, you know what I had? That fucking guy, Steve Laguerre. You know what um, I don't get? He's bass playing. <laughs> <laughs> I, let's happen. Let's happen. I, I, like, fair enough, I suppose, maybe at that time, I wasn't around in the 70s to comment, but, like, Led Zeppelin, Led Zeppelin and Black Sabbath both came from the same part of England at the same time. And apparently John Bonham out of Led Zeppelin and I think also um, Robert Plant that said, they pretty much said they knew members of Black Sabbath and they said you're not going to make it. And like, I don't know, to me they were good. They're a good rock band, but to get to the point that like there was 
there was talks that they're going to do a reunion gig for a charity i think it was maybe 10 to 15 years ago and there was people paying raffle tickets close to something like 50 or 60k just to get a raffle so there was no guarantee of getting a ticket that was just a raffle to get so many tickets uh raffle tickets for a chance at a ticket for a gig i'm like who the fuck's gonna pay that and, and that's, a, that's a genius idea but you know like i'll be honest i seen i seen a clip of robert um robert plant doing a cover there was a queen trip the queen tribute concert in the 90s and robert plant doing uh was doing the vocals for innuendo and like i would be one of the first ones to say that Freddie Mercury was probably one of the best rock front men of all time. Also live, any live footage I've seen, he was stellar. And Robert Robert Plant, who was put down as one of the best Cindy's rock vocalists of all time, was terrible at that song. He could not do it. So for someone then to potentially pay to see them live 17 years later and his voice with the grade of fervor, I'd be like, why the fuck would you pay that? And on recordings, uh, fair enough, I haven't watched studio footy, uh, live concerts to comment, but, and I, I would say probably be good, but apparently Jimmy Page, live shows from a guitar playing standpoint, I've heard it from multiple sources, and also the guitarist of Wings, you know, he loves Jimmy Page, but he's, as he quotes, the brownest guitar player of all time, he would do these bad bends and stuff, like, you know, like holding these, like, bad long extended bends on a guitar note during a solo that just you shouldn't do and it could be just mistakes but when you're extending it and then throwing a few notes on the end it's correctly like oh fuck and oh there we go i meant to do that um i think it's just because of the fact that there was loads of decent semi rock bands at that era you know you had boston and journey and all that that I don't know. I don't know. I think it was to do with uh, the time era. Like stadium rock bands were big. Like some of the biggest concerts that ever happened were around that time. And I don't know. I think also down to the album art, it's very recognizable. Uh, mm. Sort of, you see it, you attracted your eye to it in the record store or whatever. You went for it. And some of their uh, biggest hits, like they are really, really good really catchy and like i would still listen to them every now and again but i i'm kind of like you i don't get why they were so big but i really do like them but i just don't know what made them stand out amongst other yeah. bands that were probably to me a lot better just yeah, didn't yeah. get that as was much but, uh i, I think i, I do think it was the era the time and just i would suppose a bit of chance really yeah okay. Every decade has their lucky band. Like I still think, I don't know about yous, but like in terms of like if you look at the grunge era, the four big bands was Pearl Jam, Alice in Chains, Soundgarden, Nirvana, <clears throat> and Nirvana was the one that that came out as effectively the one that defined that era. I think yeah. I would argue that musically, Nirvana was the weakest. I would say probably my favorite would have been Soundgarden and Alice in Chains, but then again, it's just whatever hits it off, and Led Zeppelin maybe were just the one of the seventies. I, I don't even think Led Zeppelin were the biggest of the seventies. Like I think like they're just Rolling Stones and others yes. that like just sort of again their logos, their album covers hit it off bigger. Uh, I don't know. I, I suppose it's down to personal preference uh, with that for me, but it's. Uh, Hard to say why they got so big, really, but Aye, uh, we got lucky. Yeah, yeah. 
it could just be an area where for like a period of two or three years that Robert Plant's voice was outstanding. Jimmy Page wasn't boring. Yeah. Yeah. I had this period of like, right, the right cocktail of drugs to play the right stuff. <laughs> Yeah, that's it. I'll, I'll be honest, like I've got Led Zeppelin 1 and 4 on CD and I've listened to 2 and I'm not going to deny, you know, that there's good songs, like you said and like uh, Robert, you know, Robert Plant's uh, vibrato and his range were pretty awesome but that's not to say that I still think they deserve to be the band that defines Cindy's rock bands but I don't know. East of their own. As it's well. more. I think it's more down to like "Stairway of Heaven" is one of the biggest songs of all time, and uh, whenever you think of Led Zeppelin, you think "Stairway of Heaven." The amount yeah. of like pop culture around that song alone, and even seen with "Kashmir" and "Immigration Song," "Whole Lot of Love," the amount of movies that have them songs in it has also kept them alive for so long, yeah. kept them going, and anytime you hear that song in a movie, if it's set to the right scene, you're just like, oh yeah, this is great. And I think that also helped them. There's a, there's two songs that will always get used for that, and I would say you'll agree. You've got one will be Jimi Hendrix's cover of All A Lot in the Wasp Tower, and yeah. the second one, no Vietnam film is complete without Fortunate Son by Queen's Clearwater Revival blasting in a helicopter. Yeah. Oh, come on! Make away the flag! As far as well, though, for like for like thirty years, anybody who lives in the UK will hear the intro for Whole Lot Love because of Top of the Pops. Top of the Pops. Yeah. yeah, that got kept alive. Yeah. Like, if you heard that intro, you went, "That's Top of the Pops on there." Yeah, yeah. It's, it's like when people hear the Top Gear theme and they go, "Oh, so Top Gear theme's going to Jessica. Jessica, yeah. the Jessica for the Allman Brothers, actually." <laughs> Yeah. yeah. <laughs> every, every time I think of Enneagram so I just think of winding up Maggie because I would have been on Xbox Live chat and doing that note just ah! and I was going, what the fuck are you doing? So that's I still maintain I still maintain the oceans one of the best songs. That's oh, it's a nice song. It's a pretty chill song that one. I'd rather have that than most other ones. Yeah. Um, Phil, what is your your brand to have someone that you just think I don't get it. Is that I uh, we're talking modern Green Day or all of Green Day? Mm. Yeah. What in terms of shit they have become. Um, it's just, mm. yeah. They got lazy and they started moaning and rolling around stage. I was at the concert and I loved Green Day. It was like again, like you, one of the first bands that ever introduced me to good music. And uh, the whole way up to American Idiot, great. 
see after American Idiot, like 21 Century Breakdown, it was all right. There was a couple of songs in it I could get behind. See after that, though, I've never liked one album, and I've completely went off the band, and I went and seen them for all time's sake. I was like, great, I get to see them. And I was severely disappointed, mostly because their new stuff is so bad, and that they just moaned half the time. I was like, this isn't really what I was hoping for, but the old songs that they did play, they were great, but I just think they're a band that should have given up. Uh, It could just be that we're changing. We're getting older, so we're not no. liking the new stuff. Because no, I think they're, they're still selling records. Like, there's a reason why they're still going. They're still selling. They're still selling our concerts. They're still popular. Because if they weren't, they wouldn't be making money. They wouldn't be able to do it. So that it's probably the younger generation do like the newer stuff. But we just grew up at the right age during the good stuff that we thought were good. And then now we've grown up so much that we're like, their new stuff's just bad. Yeah, but uh, no, just by the way, I have to go here, guys. But enjoy the rest of it. I'll be kicking off here anyway. No worries. Enjoy the album. Good have you, Carlos. Have a nice day, bro. No, but in saying that, though, there's the thing. There's the thing that people associate popularity with quality. You know, there's people rushing out to buy Cardi B's wet ass pussy. Yeah, but people like that though. Otherwise, she wouldn't be big. Like, there's a reason why she's top of the charts half the time is because people like that. There's enough people that like that. I will tell you why. Sex sales. Mm. Yeah. I think that part of it, sorry, the thing they should with Greeny or something about is the fact that they're in that genre where it's like the pop home skater scene. So they're just as much as any late 40s, 50s. They're just, in my head, just dressed like that because that's how. You in that busy in that realm dress. I mean, they dress with the baggy jeans and the shirt stand and the shirt with a tie. Like I don't know. Yeah, yeah I don't have anything against how the dress. It's just no, I have nothing against it. Yeah. I think that's just how they're trying to blend in. Oh, definitely. But they're from that era. A hypothetical, a hypothetical question. If Green Day didn't play skater punk and played heavy metal and still played more in a bottle jacket, does that make it any different than what it does being skater? No. Because they're still dressing as they done 30 years ago. I mean, it's you. So I think you associate. I think you, most people associate skaters up to a certain age bracket. Yeah, I think. And I, yeah, yeah. And I think once people, it's like once you get like if you're at like if a thirty year old was to run around in a nappy, you'd go. <laughs> unless, unless he's got like some sort of condition <laughs> which warrants more in a nappy. Um, but yeah, it's like you say. I don't know. It it seems. It is a fair point what you say, Kirkard, but I think the whole metal scene is very different. It's like for some reason the battle fest has seen like a macho thing, like a whoa, me man. Even like like you say, a fourteen or fifteen year old in theory could wear one and me It man. also ages better. Um, that ages I, better because metal sort of lasted, whereas the pop uh, punk sort of skater rock sort of era, it kinda like went through a phase and then kinda sort of fizzled out. I think that's where Phil's trying to like, get the point yeah. where why are they still dressed like that? That phase is done with, whereas battle jackets and that metal, they'll always be there. 
whereas these we subgenres of metal will phase out. Uh, it's just the decades now. Yeah. Like so this whole style cool. of skaters changed. So basically, it's like a step. But once you had twenty five, you stop listening to the punk and listen to metal. Yeah. 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 The natural progression. progression. You can, like small diploma to hang on the wall to say you've graduated. <laughs> <laughs> you graduated. Know, From the skill yeah. of hard knocks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. By the way, nothing against skaters. Love them best. Here, you know what? I'll, I'll see the rock thing. anymore. There's a lot of skaters now who are into rap. Um, like a, the new um, Tony Hawk's game. Tony Hawk's was always a game that you went to for really good like rock and metal tracks throughout the years. A lot of the newer games is like there's a lot of rap thrown in now. It's like times really have changed when skaters are listening to a lot more rap mm-hmm. now, where it used to be. Baggy jeans, chains, and rock. Um, and to be fair, there, there was some, there was some better hip hop and rap in the nineties. For some oh. reason, it went hand in hand with skate videos. Yeah, like um, and punk. But there's see in the remaster of the Tony Hawk's that came out recently. Yeah, there's some absolutely shite rap, like annoying hooks that are just you know repeating the same words over and over again. You're going, I, I actually find myself skating along trying to. Trying to build up a score and find that the song is pissing me off and just skip. I'm just like, this is annoying. Um, uh, the Tony, Tony Hawk Pro Skater 2 had the best soundtrack. Awesome. For me, it was uh, probably 4 or Underground because 4 introduced, well, had Less than Jake, which I absolutely loved at the time. Uh, Iron Maiden, you got to play as Eddie and all. Like, it just it was good for me. But all them games up until the fifth, fifth one were really good uh, for music, and the fifth one just kind of killed it all. Was the, was Underground the one that had, I think it had, like, Lamb of God and, like, In Flames and Ween on the same side? It had in I, was like, I was like, yes. Yeah. But uh, one, one thing I will say about Green Day, before we move on to the albums, was that I remember, like, you guys were saying that American, in, American Idiot was your entry into... Oh, well, Dookie was my entry, but American Idiot was the exit. It was a great album to leave to, though. Dookie was my entry. I I heard Dookie, Nimrod, and... Oh, what do you... There was Dookie, Nimrod... Warning. What did, Warning. Well, Warning. There, was, there was the one in between. The one in between Dookie and Nimrod. Oh. Insomniac? Or... Insomniac. That was it. They, I heard those. I heard those three and Warning before American Idiot came out. And the thing that left me conflicted with American Idiot was the album was good and it was a concept album and the songs were well written, like Jesus Suburbia and stuff it was well fleshed out. You know, what that was like a, I, it was what like an eight minute long song separated yeah. into like four parts. It was like a rock opera. It was quite clever. But the one thing that I was always at odds with and. I don't know why. It was Green Day did Warning, and you could tell that they'd like grown up a bit because well, the approach to the songs and the subject matter, and then the product that and Good Charlotte had just hit it big with the fucking eyeliner and all worn black shirt, <laughs> black shirts. Suddenly Green Day, black eyeliner, black shirts. I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? And I, I don't know why that was like the bad taste in my mouth that it was just. I don't know if it was a case of record labels went, hey, those kids like eyeliner and black t-shirts, see? And they were forced to adopt that look, but either way, they had a big following before then. You would think they would have a bit of, like, sway in the matter to go, nah. But, no, they... I, I don't know. Like, I know it doesn't affect the music, but... I don't know. Whenever you're watching... I, I don't know. And I think the part that might have influenced the whole thing... It's like what you said, Phil, about laziness in writing. I think if a band is doing something current and political, you need to make sure that you have something new to say, rather than maybe just, hey, everyone hates this guy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, it, 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 it doesn't age well. Yeah. It's like there's, there's the band Pain of Salvation, the Swedish progressive metal band. 
have a song called America. And there's one of their songs was, so you're, I can't remember the exact paraphrasing, but it's something like, so you're scared that the Arabs will kill for your, for their God while you kill for yours. That's a pretty timeless argument in terms of the whole Middle East conflict at that time. There's more to it, that at least they got a bit of a thought process and they'd be like, well, this is what we think. But like you say, is more timeless. No problem. We'll be doing the albums once you're back. Good luck. Um, so, yes. So I'm going to have to actually get my phone and go by the notes that I've made. Every album, I took notes of songs and what I liked about the songs. I didn't take every song because I thought, fuck, we'll be here the next week. So I'm going to go through them. Obviously, there's the issue that, well, there's four of the seven Half people. people are dear. Yes, four, four of the uh, seven people. There's one in particular for people that are watching. We'll be going for the albums, but I think all four here know who one of the albums are choosing, but it's a safe bet. The other two, well, sus. Um, but I have the votes for Steve and Gary, who can make it. And Carl doesn't count because he didn't get listening to them all. <laughs> but we'll, we'll not go into that. Anyway, long story short, there's always next time. Uh, life gets in the way. So um, this will be quite interesting. Uh, I, the, actually, while we've got time here, I'll actually run down the albums that we had. So let's see. I've got the artist names, but I don't actually have the the albums as well noted down. So I just want to double check those, just you know, for anyone who's interested. So let's say we go here. What have we got? So we had of the seven albums that were picked, we had Ninja by the band Orbit Culture. We had From Voodoo to Zen by Tides of Nebula. With Crystal Death by Earthcaller, with Imperial by Zoe, and War Mix by Deep Forest, Transitus by Arion, and The Guardian Collection by Sean James. Oh. Welcome back. Good selection. So Let's see it. it was a fairly eclectic mix for people watching. You know, it was. Yeah, I get it. Fair enough. There was there was what there was one or two metal albums, but in them on that, you'd singer songwriter, you'd word music, you'd instrumental music that was somewhere between electronic and progressive. Um, definitely a few curveballs, but then again, last time you know you'd, you'd pop punk in them on like stoner metal and weird jazzy. Progressive metal that Gary hated. Um, so we'll start off with the first one that we're going to go down. So the first uh, album that I went through was, let's see, here, was uh, Ninja by Orbit Culture. So um, to start that off, Kirker, if you want to take the floor, you know, obviously we're going to take the approach with these albums. You know, we're going to act. Some of us are going to act like, we've, you know, we didn't pick this album. Oh, I really like this. So, uh, Kirk, if you want to give your thoughts on Ninja by Orbit Culture, and then we'll move along. We'll go around. I, like I thought it was fantastic. The second song, North Star to Ninja, and that just set the tone, I think. It just went pretty hardcore from there. One thing I was surprised by afterwards, was the fact that the music, the lyrics, everything, the production, the mixing, was all done by the frontman. It's impressive. I didn't know that. By the one guy. Because they're still not massively well-known from what I've read, but they're kind of working their way up right quickly. Do you think they've got a sound that if they get the right single and the right video to go with the single, I think potentially they could 
be the kind of band that would be supporting, you know, like Gojira and Lamb of God, you know, those yep. sorts of, you know, what have now become the mainstays of like bigger yep. venue metal. I was saying earlier, I think it's their sound is like a mashup between sort of Metallica and Gojira. I don't know about you, but to me, vocally, <laughs> the guy reminded me of like the Crusade era Trivium. You know, like Mad Heafy doing head theme? That's, I that's... definitely got the Metallica vibe from them. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. Now, the Growls, the Growls reminded me of the band Scar Symmetry. When the guy yeah. Christian was still in the band, Christian, for anyone that hasn't heard Scar Symmetry, they are a melodic, progressive death metal band from Sweden. That's a mouthful. But long story short, the band mixes, you know, it has the heavier aspects of growling and also melodic singing. Now, the original vocalist left the band after the third album. But to show how good his range was, they needed two vocalists to replace him. That says that says everything I need to say about how good he is as a vocalist in terms of range. But the low end, his voice, the um, orbit culture reminded me of that guy Christian. Time the mix. That's impressive. So they, seem to be like, they seem to be relatively young as well. Like, they seem to be sort of all early mid twenties. If that, I don't know how old they are, mm. but they often be era. But the one thing I have to say I didn't like about them more now is the fact that whenever it got heavy and hard, it was relentless. It was just brutal, and the drum, the drummer was outstanding. Yeah, I, I'll be honest. That was that was one of the things I meant. I actually noted was that the to me the highlight of the album was the vocalist and the drummer yeah and the best song for me was the way phil mentioned about the, the softer bits that took you on a wires the song behold was a good one because it was one of those ones that started out quite soft and then it built up but my favorite one was probably open eye i don't know why but i made me a testament that, see that that gruff i see that chorus sound reminds me of i don't know it it just sounded like a a billy from testament vocal hook but i north star ninja and day of the cloud were great songs besides that as well they were a good way to kick off the album i don't know if i've heard the, well the right album but they had a, a bonus track at the end of what i was on be the silent at the very end of it i mean the silent was Fantastic. And if you ever want to hear the Metallica Gojira mix, that is the song that would pretty define that. Yeah. It is. And there is even a yeah in there somewhere along. Yeah! The <laughs> Must be like an homage to Mr. Hedford. <laughs> well, the, the definitely, it, it sounds like the word they influenced it on the sleeve, but. Definitely. Um, um, so, are you guys happy enough for that? Would you like to move on to the next one? Yeah, like I, I'm just the same with you. I, I got Metallica faded. I thought Open Eyes was a great song. Uh, just I think that was the one that really sort of was like Metallica, yeah. And then Mara Slave, one straight after it. That good was song, a really good song. So, pretty decent band, like, yeah. I. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you like one, um, say so you like them all. Um, the first, I'll be honest, and I, like truth be told, that first time listening to it, because of the consistency at first, I sort of felt it, it blurred, you know, as in like I was, as bad as it sounds, this may sound bad to people that haven't listened to it, 
I would still recommend listening to it. First time listening to it, I was like, there was, there was trying to find songs that stood out. But whenever I listened to it the second time through, those things came back. You know, that it, there was things that stood out about the songs that I could be like, yes. You know, there's hooks and Open Eye was a good example of that. So, no, I would say that's one of those. I think that's an album that if you listen to three or four times, you you appreciate more and more as I listen to it. I think it's yeah. a grower. I think it's almost went full circle here because at the start of this whole thing, Card was talking about how a hook from a Tool song be four seconds long. It pick your interest. Yeah. And there in a second listen, potentially third listen round, something has caught your earballs. Yeah. Yeah. That so you never the picked up on the first time. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So and with that then we've got the next one. So what was the next one then? That was so that was Tide of Nebula. And that, that was um from Voodoo to Zen. Um so what did you think of this one? I absolutely loved it. I thought that was an amazing album. It was, uh, was love the type of band. It really, really reminded me of uh, the Helix Nebula. Obviously, Nebula in the name again, but uh, I just really enjoyed listening to it. It took me off guard as well. I didn't really expect it, but uh, I thought it was a real solid album the whole way through. The first song, uh, Ghost of Horses, was just got you uh it caught me and i was just like yeah this is a great album already i was just sort of like i, I can't wait to listen to the rest of it so i uh, got through and then dopamine was a great song and the self-titled song from voodoo to zen uh them three were the big songs that stood out to me but i really enjoyed listening to that album i mean dopamine i don't know why i really don't know why but for some reason i've heard dopamine before See the moment that, that there was like that yeah. in, in the middle, you know, like the hook that drives yeah. it. That, it? The moment that kicked in, I was like, I fucking heard this, but I don't know where from. That was... That, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. It, it really was like instantly like, I've heard this before. Because I knew nothing about the band. So I don't know if at some point someone sent me that and I've listened to it. And I haven't taken a note of the artist, but... The moment I heard it, I was like, fuck that, that's good. And I didn't expect it to be an instrumental album, but it yeah. was a different instrumental album. It was, I think they're from Poland. Uh, not sure where they're from. I, I think I looked up there. There was just three guys, but, you know, it's rare that you get, like, instrumental, where the way they, for people that haven't listened to them, somewhere between i would i would say probably like electronic and would maybe say some form of like instrumental progressive rock because the fuse goes together i think um they maybe don't use standard rock instruments they maybe rely on more electronic influences but i mean there was what was the song i have a note of a song there that, that did use guitar in it a lot and it was Oh, oh, nothing to fear, nothing to doubt. That was the one. Yeah. Yeah. Focus on it. Yeah. Funny, funny you mention it. I actually was going to mention that as well. Is the fact that I was I was conflicted that way that like it felt like an album you could have on the background and not really pay attention to, it, but still enjoy it. Yeah, it was it, but not to say that you know you, you could dismiss it, but because of the fact that there's it's more like it felt like movements, you know. It yeah. was, 
that boring that you don't really just completely phase it out. It still was interesting enough that you could sort of you were aware that it was there and you could be doing other things and it just fit perfectly. Yeah. So I was sitting playing games while listening to it and it just fit really well. It was really chilled the uh, album. So I really enjoyed it. Well like I don't know about you, but there was like songs that would come on and you and me would have checked the name of the track because you were like yeah. curious, but like, oh wonder what that's called. <laughs> Yeah, for me that album itself was actually a big surprise. I didn't expect it. No instrumental. Didn't expect it at all. No. Didn't expect it to be the kind of music it is. No. The thing about all these albums is that I would listen to Walking Home. It takes me 40, 45 minutes to walk home, mm-hmm. and that's it. So headphones on and just zone out and away. I got to my house. The album hadn't finished, and I was genuinely annoyed that I had to turn my headphones off. I loved it. I thought it was brilliant. I was, I was furious. I kind of stood in the front garden for five minutes just listening to the last track. <laughs> and the neighbor's going, he's a weirdo. <laughs> just standing, just <laughs> nope, nope, yeah. knocking into the I refuse. Place. And it nah. was just one of those albums that was just, I did not expect it. I yeah. fell in love with it straight away. I'm Don't the make same. a great track. I think uh, from the title track itself, I just stopped. Mm-hmm. And it was, yeah. it was just, it as. Well said, it hit that sweet spot. It was just yeah. that right amount of sort of electronic side of it mixed with the ambient side of it. It just yeah. hit that right on the head. And yeah, was there cool. wasn't too much of either. It's, it's a good, it's a good remember, example. Do you ever, you ever mention that you'd be proud of yourselves? You're a love's a legend. <laughs> you don't stop I know if you know. <laughs> I think, I think, you know what? There's like good examples of electronic music. I'll be honest, like for someone that listens to a lot of and and writes a lot of death metal and stuff, I I love electronic music as well. But it it I don't know about you, it has to have a mood. It has to have something that I don't know, I mean, it's just pretentious as fuck. But to me, like, see if you're listening to something and you get like a weird image conjured in your head, to me that's good music. And that that's a good example of it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I worked in a circular, yeah, it's a, like a catch 22, but not. Yeah. No, no, you, you've made a good point there. It's, it's that they're, they're creating a product or then uh, a, a piece of art. Yeah, it's just a case of turn out. We need something to fill the airplane. That'll do. And I think that's it. that is kind of sad. <laughs> but On the bright side, it made me forget I was walking home down to Prince George's Way. But it cheered me up. So there you go. Well, I think I think it's fair to say we know what your top three is going to look like. <laughs> really, man? Because that's like that's like the second worst album I listen to. What? <laughs> me, you. I was going to say. Well, the the albums, that's it. Unfortunately, it's the second worst. Sorry. Are you actually serious? Are you taking the piss? I don't, I don't know. I think he's taking the piss. I I, I want to hear it right. Move on next album. I want to get to the results. I'm really, I'm really curious to know what his top three. Yeah. Like, like, bring this up. So the next one was uh, a bit by Earth Caller, and that album was Crystal Death. What did he make of that? Loved it. You know what? It was one of those albums that I listened to, and I don't want to sound like a douche, but it was it was like one of those albums that I feel like I shouldn't have enjoyed, but I did. As in, like, yeah, I, you know what it was? It was it was because it's right. Well, well, 
cut to an example, I think Gary mentioned it in the last podcast, that Gary was annoyed the fact that Scarif had once said to him that, that Gary's style of music is testosterone metal. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, to me, what Scarif is embodying there is, you know the kind of metal that you would say, you know, and this isn't any disservice to Gary, because I know he's watching, is, you know, I would say what he, Scarf was trying to convey was, you know the sort of metal that you'd imagine jocks in America, you know, whenever, before they go and play for college football, yeah, bad finger just punch, yeah man, you know that, and in some, ca- to some capacity I felt like, no, no, that's just me. I, well, I'm, no, I'm, I'm saying nothing on this subject because I will get into all sorts of trouble. <laughs> uh, because you're on video. Um, but no, uh, Earth Caller, like, I think it was more the, the way the songs were written, but they were strong. So even though, like, in some ways, there's things that I could say that generally I, I, I feel like have been done, they did well, though. So. That's that's my point. I'm trying to make is that I and I I did enjoy it. Like it was punchy. It was ballsy. Um, like they knew when the way the songs were written, they knew how to make you aware. This is the chorus. I know. Like, a really great joke here, Ran. Nice pussy. You're catching you. I'm actually more surprised he hasn't jumped up on the table. Give it time. Um. But the songs that stood out for me, like not to, not to be like, um, quoting the obvious, but the first few songs were really strong. See, Pipe Dreams and Sucker, and yeah. Never in, Never Around. What was there was the one? Um, I think there was there was Mirror and May Sixteen were good songs as well. It, it was a it's an interesting album because even though like by if you were to like, if you were to put that on Radio 1, some people go, oh, I don't like all those shit and stuff. But for the most part, it was quite melodic for the kind of music. It was, like, post-hardcore. That's, but I got the sort of it was like borderline hardcore, post-hardcore sort of I, thing. Like, post-hardcore, new metal, metalcore, somewhere along those. For, yeah. people that, for people that don't know anything about those ones, they'll be like, what the fuck are you talking about? But, yeah. I, I'm not even, you know, there's not enough time to go into like breaking down classifications of genres, but that's to me what they sound like to me. That's for another podcast. The genres. That would be a good one. That would be. Why they should be three and. What was that? You, you cut out there, buddy? Oh, there should be three and only three genres. <laughs> break it. Just make it we'll simple. We'll see that for another day. Yeah. And um, does anyone else? Want to say anything else about uh, your color? They were just meh. They didn't they stand out to me. They didn't really click at all. Uh, it was like it was a decent album, but it was just like I could have clicked on any other band, sort of related to them, and probably got the same sort of outcome from them. It was just like it was meh. I just didn't really nothing stood out. It was just. Yeah, I'll get this album over and done with, move on to the next, but it's alright. I wouldn't really go listen to them again. It just didn't really suit me. Like, I don't mind that music, it's just that band was just generic. Yeah. Like, the music was alright. It was a vocalist, I think, it was sort of... Do you think you would? Do you think you would have liked it more if the vocalist had more grit, as in like a deep, like a more aggressive voice, or like yeah. a more harsher tone, or do you no. think it was just? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I, I think that was I think that was the thing for me. But I felt 
like say say for Toxic we were at a festival and they were on, I think they'd be interested in watch live. I, I I think I think that would be one I would be curious to see. You know, you know when you get a vibe from a band you'd be like, I'd be curious to know if they actually have packed more of a punch live. You know, there's you'd have all probably have seen some band at some point that you went, Fuck, they're better on stage than they are on an album. So I don't know. I don't know. I, I think like if they were on at a festival, I think I'd walk away and go find another band. <laughs> like, no disrespect to them. Like, they're all right, but just I could probably go find another band I'd like more. Easy. I think it was a, it was a solid album. I I enjoyed the album because I'm more geared towards that kind of stuff. Yeah. But I would say that literally, I think if the first two songs of that album were maybe tracks five and seven, Instead of being the first two, it's like almost like you fucking hit your peak at the third song, and um, then you kind of just peter off. If you had it built towards the really good songs in the middle, spread them in a little bit more, it would have been cracked. But uh, all in all, I thought it was a solid album. I thought it was pretty good. The vocalist, yeah, I mean, it could have been a bit more diversity in there, but all in all, I thought it was pretty pretty solid. I did think it tailed off at the start. The best two songs are the ones you mentioned, but I think the first two the ones at the start, that yeah. album. Got me into it, like I said, like, this could be awesome. And yeah. then... It didn't go anywhere. It didn't happen. I think... It's plateaued. Uh, I Thanks. think... I, I think I think there's... That's the thing, like, me and Carl were winching about <laughs> earlier on. It's that... It turns out, like, I everyone's got their own preference in terms of the sound of things. Like, if, yeah. people, on, if people on here... Kirkers and another person that would dabble in playing guitar, but typically speaking, I I think there's a time and place for using certain um, rhythmic patterns and playing in terms of guitar, like playing just an open string on the bottom, uh, open note on the bottom string. You know, in terms of like using the fretboard effectively to write completely different songs. See, whenever you're using the same area on a guitar repeatedly, it it can really add to your detriment that the songs start to blend. I uh, were you know far enough. It's also really good fretboard. Ah, uh, you know it's it's like probably why a lot of people can't get into Meshuga because the sheer fact that Meshuga opts for using. You know the eight and the six, or the seven string quite a lot the majority of the time, and it's usually the first few frets. You know they're all going to be. I think it's I think it's because Michigan because of um, Thomas Hacker's drum fucking signatures. You can't get bang it in time. Yeah, you can't. Like I, I, you have some kind of neck spasm and you're. <laughs> it's but you know what? See, whenever like not to get off topic from the albums, but whenever you analyze. How those patterns are broken down. Mental, and like, like I wouldn't listen to them that often. But from a technical standpoint, and I don't even play drums. I'm like, what? Yeah. It's, I, I like, yeah. For people that don't know anything about Michigan, just do research into the the time, the musical time signatures he is feeder doing from his hands are two different things, and the coordination. You know, people talk about rubbing your belly and patting your head at the same time. This is like an octopus doing eight different things at the same time. Just so, Google a uh, just Google a clockworks place for my sugar, and that'll tell you everything. You know. That or bleed the bleed drum count. Yeah, and to some they'll be like that's repetitive, but believe you me, you try and do the same thing over and over again for five minutes and keep steady rhythm, you'll fuck up. Guaranteed. So the next one was um, World Mix by Deep Forest. What's the next one? Oh, the next one was World Mix by Deep Forest. Oh no, what's the one after that? <laughs> you didn't like that one then? <laughs> <laughs> He's making it that obvious, I think. Here, it's here. Actually, see, before we start, can I urinate and get a beer top up? Because I know this is like. I know this is highly unprofessional, you know, midstream, but make your calls. Phil, are you the same? Yeah, same. Right, well, we'll do it. We'll do it back. We'll do like 
Drink, bathroom, check, and come back for the last three then? Yeah. That'll do. Right, no worries. Oh, because I am not going to be entertainment for five minutes. Just, just, well, just do a wee, a wee tap down through for five minutes. Five minutes. Just do shoot. One sec. This is where I get philosophical now. Hi there. And we're back. And we're and back. back. After we pissed. Um, so, yes, this next album was World Mixed by Deep Forest. So, I'm curious to see whoever wants to take point first. Go for it. Right, I'll admit, I did listen to it. You for did. one reason only, because when I tried to find it on Spotify, I couldn't find the album that was recommended. I had the, I had the same problem. So I had to find a playlist. So, I literally went to the first one the club and went into it. And it played an almost treble version of Komodo by Mauro Picotto, the old trance music from the late 90s. You can't beat a bit of trance. And I love trance. I love Mauro Picotto. I will admit, I do like my old trance music. Mm -hmm. And I went, nope, and then skipped it and never listened to a single song afterward. So, who's next? <laughs> <laughs> well. <Wow. laughs> <laughs> Well, you know what? I'll be honest. I I liked it. I I you know what it was. What I liked it, but it was the early nineties production. It it nineties. That was the thing I loved about the nineties was that it seemed to be. I don't know what the fuck happened in the nineties, but nineties music. It was just like anything went. Yeah, yeah. It was great. The you had gangster rap. You had world music. You had dance. Just took it off out of nowhere. You. Grunge, yeah. Even the pop was good, and then you All had lie because of cancel culture. Oh yeah, it might, might trigger someone. Yeah. yeah. It was a smorgas. It was a smorgasbord of sound. Yeah, and you know what? You know how I can, I can attribute to that was listening back to the, the top forty. On a Sunday, I used to do that, and it was awesome. Now yeah. I would rather sit on a cheese grater. Um, but were but deep that deep forest album reminded me of. I don't know why it reminded me of that sort of sound. I don't know if you've ever heard of Enigma. There was a they did one hit wonder in the nineties, Return to Innocence, and it was the it was the one where. You would know it more for the Native American guy going, ha, ha, ha. Yeah, yeah, I know that song. Great song. But well, there was that. What's that? Well, that's not racist at all. No, well, that's not science. You know. No, that is the thing. I've not seen anything do off the I've done a terrible impersonation of it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. But there was Nina Cherry as well. She did a bit of world music. It, well, you wouldn't say all her songs were world music, but Seven Seconds Away definitely was. But like, I Return to Innocence it reminded me of that. Um, it was just nice and chilled. It was like um, Tides of Nebula, but in a different way. I felt that I could have that playing in the background and still enjoy it, but zone in and out. And still take something from it. Um, it was just now. Don't get me wrong. There was one or two tracks that the vocal samples that were looped. I could argue there was one song in particular I noted, and I remember at the time going, "That vocal looks kind of annoying." But it was the only. Besides that, it was haunting. But first twilight, and there was. Let's see. The ones I liked were. There was Deep Fire, Sweet Lullaby, First Twilight and Savannah Dance. Um, but it was nice and chill. Um, and a nice wee break from the metal. What did you think? Yeah. 
Yeah, and put your attention back in. Yep. Cultures? I don't know what, yeah. Some mm -hmm. might say a world mix. <laughs> hey! <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, same. Well, I uh, I enjoyed it. I thought it was real, real different. Uh, like I said, uh, Deep Forest, Sweet Lullaby, Desert Walk. Like, I, there's so many songs I could name of that it just really grabbed me, and I was like, yeah, I really like it. And it was a big change from the other albums we had. They were mainly metalish, but. Uh, yeah, I, I just really enjoyed it. Thought it was really different. Um, uh, real good background music as well. So. I'll, put it one thing on this. I'll point out one thing on it that I know that I may have dismissed this far too early. I will mm -hmm. go back and listen to it again. I will. You're mad. Well, for you, like, in, I don't know, I would like to say you would listen to some out there stuff at times. And, you know, yeah. if you still. Have your appreciation for 90s music. I'd recommend it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I was like, as much as I may be like a metalhead and like proper death metal stuff, I am an absolute sucker for the old late 90s, early 2000s trans music. Oh, same. I love it. Was good, but it was like, you had the old, your at Dodge Over Springs, you had your York, you had your Wakeman, you had Nathan Shaman. By any family. You had all the classics. Yeah, I mean, it's the classics. I am a sucker for As much as I will listen to anything from bludgeoning death metal to some kind of South American boss and other stuff, I am open down and I didn't give it its due diligence. We'll listen to it. I okay. shall report back on the next podcast. <laughs> okay. The next one I was going to move on to was going to be. Imperial by Soin. So they're a Swedish oh, prog metal band, from what I've seen. Um, for me, they're a band that vocally, I don't know why, I don't know why the vocalist reminds me of Mikhail Ackerfeldt tone wise. So Mikhail Ackerfeldt, for people that aren't well educated in those matters, is a Swedish musician who's best known for OPEF, but he's in a, been in a few bands, but OPEF were a progressive death metal band, so they started out blending 70s progressive rock with death metal, which is an unlikely combination, but since they've sort of migrated and they've just been sort of 70s pro, pro, prog revivalist, and they would combine growling and sending, but Mikhail's got a lovely singing voice. He's got a lovely voice. But this guy in Soin, this band is just melodic all the way through singing. And tone-wise, this guy reminds me of Mikhail at times. I don't know why. I, I don't know if it's just the sound of his voice. It's maybe not so much the melodies that they use, but his vocal tone. I think there's similarities. But like Lemurian and Deceiver, and Monarch and Illusion were four great starts to the album, and Dissident was a great song as well. But I, I wouldn't really say there's any songs on the album I didn't enjoy. I think it's a grower album, though. I think it's one, the more you listen to it, the more the tracks stand out because they have a consistency again, like what I mentioned with Orbit Culture. But yeah, they're. I can't really think of a band I would say the sound like, but the, I would say they're more. I think they're a prog band with a slightly unique sound. I think they're one of those bands that you could probably, if you heard a song, you'd be like, ah, that's them. Hmm. Ah, because it's really tight.
I was really tight, really compressed. I uh, I love that band. I uh, found them a few years ago, and ever since, like, I always find myself going back to them just really solid. Uh, they don't have too many albums, so there's not, you don't get lost in their discography, but the from the album? first album uh, yeah. onwards, yeah, they've got, I think it's like four albums, five albums now. But, uh, like, their first album, like, onwards, and then whenever Imperial actually released this year, it was like, Yes, can't wait to get on to that, hear what the the new stuff sounds like, and it did not disappoint. Uh, the whole way through, I thought the album was great, and just completely up the standard, and it was just very good listening to, really enjoyed listening to it. Um, yeah, I'll continue listening to it, I just love the album, it's a great album. I know, uh, for, for example, there's a friend of ours, Sesker, he particularly loved this album. This is the, his album of the year, from what I know at the moment. And he's a big fan of the band Evergrey, another band from Sweden. And I think this band, this album, was ahead of even their latest release for him. And fuck, he loves Evergrey. Um, yeah. Uh, personally, I didn't like. I just, had never heard, I've never heard this band beforehand, and I, it just, it was just, to me, it was just, I was bored. I did nothing for you? No, I did nothing, and to be honest, in fairness with it, I did give it a second. I and just, in case it was a grower for you? I made it maybe halfway through, I was yeah. so bored and turned it off. I just I, couldn't, I just couldn't get into it at all. Yeah. I just, Nothing to me, there was nothing sort of I'd stood out. About it. It, was just, it was just music. <laughs> it was just, I, I know what you mean, as in like technical music, yeah, yeah. And as in, it didn't feel like it was filling any boxes, so to speak, like any, yeah, any gaps in the market, yeah. No, there's, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm not gonna get it wrong. I mean. Production wise, everything sounded good. Mm-hmm. All the people can play their instruments, that's well and good. The guy can sing, but it just done. Um, I just. But that's the beauty. Just awesome for you. But that's the beauty of music. You know, you can have. You can have something that really should tick all the boxes, but. Just doesn't. I don't know. Has no emotional response that you just like. Ah. Yeah, exactly. Again, that's, that's the joys and wonders of, of sound. Mm hmm. Everybody's ears have a different fucking perspective of what's totally true. This you can have, yeah. So I suppose it's like you know, somebody could have a symphony and somebody go, I don't like it, man. But you'd be like, from a technical standpoint, you'd be like, oh, do you like it? Yeah, it could, it could literally be anything. Mm-hmm. It could go back to literally having a four second pick, as Carl said earlier, but four second pick. Yeah, that would catch your your earbuds, and you'll go, "Yep, I like this now." But like, what you really, but what you really like is four seconds of a song. Yeah, I but that, that yeah, those four so, those four seconds save the song. Yeah. yeah, but the four seconds could completely change the context of the song you're listening to. Yeah, it could it could yeah, yeah. suddenly brighten it. It could suddenly darken it. Yeah. Okay. Unfortunately, that album for me just didn't didn't take any boxes from. It's like there's. The album um, "Colors" by Between the Bear and Me. Great album. It's a, it's a, it's one of those albums that really Hard requires. Time, it requires work. It's like it would be like watching a four-hour-long cut of a film. There's a lot to digest, but like that's this thing that I watched last night. Like what? <laughs> Justice League, four hours. Yep, that's right. Four hour long cut. I, I don't know if I'll bother. To be fair, I actually enjoyed it. Really? Yeah, and I'm not into the DC Marvel superhero thing. I, I've heard not. good things about it. There you go, folks. You've heard it here first. Um, but no, as I was saying, same applies for films, actually. But you'll you'll maybe get something that maybe it's not to say that all that surrounds it is a, a is a notion of shit, but it's maybe like. 
something that peaks within a song, an album, a film that at some point just makes you go, you know, just there's something, I don't know, the contrast that's done just right that makes you go, wow. Like you said, four seconds, that's all it takes. Yeah. Or as Take That said, it only takes a minute, girl. Um, <laughs> so, is that what Mike, is that what Mike said? No, no, that's an R. Um, so the next one was going to be the Guardian Collection by Sean James. What did you think? Who the fuck suggested that? I well, was I was completely thrown off for a start. I was just kind of like, oh, what am I listening to? Uh, like, I don't know. I think it was just uh, I was really in the mood listen to the metal and it was like yep yeah. and then that just came on and it completely threw it me off of what i was listening to I was like okay and uh i don't know i think it just surprised me more than anything but it was it was all right it was just i don't really have much to say about it it was all right it was for me it's... i think from from it from it <laughs> oh i like what kirker said uh for me from a from a strip back, Drew Fort, right? So for obviously there's I have to bear in mind, you know, you folk that haven't seen it. So it was like a it's a singer songwriter type album, very strip back, just acoustic guitar vocals. But to me, it was the right length, and it was consistent. It was more is the the guy's voice. Is what sold it for me. I know it, again. I think it applies more. Like I got a nod. The guy's the guy's voice is what sold it. Like what we said before, you can have something that just hits a note right with you. And his voice to me did that. Like through the valley, as the song progressed, as he cut to the end, and he got more grit in his voice. It's fucking hit you in the feels, man. You know, um, what, actually, through the valley was this one song that did really stick out to me. That song actually was really good. Actually, kind of, the problem was I think because I listened to the whole album all in one go, it was kind of just it, nothing really stuck with me. But that one song, through the valley, that was an outstanding song. The rest of it was good. It just not really memorable because I can't really remember the album. So like, it was all right. But, I, I I think that was the only thing for the album for me was that because you know if someone has an acoustic guitar and it's just them and their voice for the most part there was a consistency to the songs but to the point that there was maybe a similar mood yeah. and temperament to each of the songs that you got to the, the vibe that I could see where you could maybe blend the tracks yeah. but but there was strength in the consistency, like the song Rake. I don't know why. There was certain parts of it. I don't know why we're meant to be Scarborough Fur by Sammy Garfunkel. I don't know why. But like Burn the Witch was a really good song. And I like the cover of like Stone and Trying to Say Goodbye. I didn't expect an audio slave and Macy Gray cover. Um but the last what was the last song? Haunted? That had like a bit of a southern rock vibe, like the distortion on the guitar, and it sounded like slide from what I remember, slide guitar playing. So it was a different way to end the album as well, but I did like it. Um, I think it's, I think there's the problem when you have, when you've been exposed to so many different genre types, and you, you suddenly get like what you said, Dicky, you go from. And assault in the senses, the something stripped back and its more simplistic nature. It has a different impact on you. It's normally I, I switch between genres, no problem, like one song into the next, completely different. I don't know, it was just uh, with that acoustic sort of stuff, for a full, what, what length was the album? It was like uh, 48 minutes. Like it just kind of gets. A bit boring whether the song's good or not it's just kind of like i just need a bit more liveliness it must have just been the mood i was in at the day, time or mm -hmm. just what i was doing at the time but it was just sort of like i need something a bit more upbeat lively 
other than that, like very talented musician. Like it, the album was good, but it just didn't really stick with me as much as some of the others. Mostly because I say it was probably just the mood I was playing games or something at the time, and I was needing that something a bit more lively to go with it. But uh, it was. Again, Through the Valley stood out to me, but the rest, although those probably were good, it just didn't stick to me as much. That's all. Okay. I've, I've, heard, I've heard this guy before, before this album. And yeah, Through the Valley, the dream. Fantastic song. Fantastic. As you say, Rana's voice is just awesome. It has a real sort of grit and gravel to it. Yeah. That's also, if anybody's ever watched it. He does a fantastic cover of Number of the Beast. Does he? he? Does he? Oh, that, that one trust me. I highly recommend you all watch it because it's pretty outstanding. It reminds me, I don't know if I've listened to it, there's a guy called The White Buffalo. Yes, yes, that's a good comparison. He reminds me of him with that gravelly voice. Oh, The White Buffalo is probably 20 years old. Then. Maybe not, I don't know, but... He's White Buffalo is... Him. White Buffalo is Sean James when he's 25 years old and he's got a kidney replacement that <laughs> it's <Sure>. disheveled <laughs> but yeah but yeah. Like, again it's it was but as Dickie said it was as much as i love the guy and i'd love this that strip back stuff it was just a yeah it was a good album i could quite happily have it on the background but it's not something that would go into so, you know what this is classic here's my money take it now yeah mm. Yeah, it's it is, it is great to listen to in the background. I love the guy. I think he's great. It's just it was it was a good album for me. So, well, recommend Number of the Beast. Go check it out afterwards. There you go. I'd agree. Well, I think well, I will listen to him more. Just because you said he does number the bass cover, I think I'll actually go and actually that's more of than just that album and uh see what else he he can do because he does yeah. have an amazing voice i'd love to hear him do other stuff if he does yeah, that, i will say that that cover of number of the beast did almost showcases okay and... that's good what he's capable of yet highly recommend oh. so the last album that we're going to be talking about is transitus or transistus I can't remember the correct pronunciation, but it's by the, the band Arion. So for a bit of background, Arion is a effectively a one man uh, project. Pro, pro, a project from a guy from the Netherlands called Arjun Lucasen, who practically deals in doing concept albums. They're all connected um, that are science fiction based and you will enlist all different vocalists to play different characters across these albums. So they're all fairly connected. This most recent one, um, this this album is the most recent one. What I found from this album was it was very much closer to the rock op opera vein because he had uh, Tom Baker who's most well known for playing Doctor Who, being a narrator across the storyline, which this would be two discs long. 
so it's a fairly long album it's maybe a concept album and um, i'll not give too much of the story away but for anyone can actually interested the whole gist is of two lovers one is a white guy and one is a um trying to think of the best classification for this without causing an uproar and um, afro-caribbean uh no a, a black girl and something or other happens in the story that it makes out that the um the white guy was killed at the start of the story and hark up to this point and that there's some sort of limbo afterlife and a story that unfolds between the events that take place so for me uh i really liked it i've always liked area on them um you know concept albums as a whole are marmite i think you'll get people that love the idea depend on how it's executed or people that test the idea of like a you know a consistency through the tracks that's like a story people can some people can give two shits about a story as far as music goes me personally i think it's a good thing it glues the songs together um this one was different for them it had a different feel the start of the album felt like a rock up opera crossed with like a 1980s horror sci-fi musically but the, the only night for the most part i really liked the album the vocal performances always nearly everyone every on album it gets fucking great performances i like the vocalists especially tommy karavik out of seventh wonder and cami gilbert out of oceans of slumber burning and also the guy uh, what's that d snyder d snyder was great i Shit. think whenever i heard it the first time i heard the song uh was it get out now uh, yeah. the first time i heard that song i was like i knew that voice but i didn't expect it to be d snyder i was like fuck that's the best he's heard and he's probably in his 60s now yeah um also you get paul paul manzi out of arena his moments were great um there was um for the most part like i really enjoyed the album there was a few towards the end that i feel like could have been cut down because it was veering on opera you know in terms of i am over here why are you over there i am over here what are you doing there you know where you're just like Get to the fucking point. I, that, that's rare. That, that, it's rare that I would get that with an Aryan album, but it was only it was only one song, and it was what was the song? I have it noted down here. She is innocent. It, it just it, it I felt like that could have been a lot shorter. But for the rest of it, there was like we interludes where it was maybe one vocalist getting their moment to shine, and I thought they were brilliant. But um, yeah, I enjoyed it. Um, I think it's a grower again, but to be honest, the mid of it, a two disc concept album typically are going to be because they take a lot of time to absorb close to, you know, an hour and a half to two hours worth of music. That's a lot to take in, but I tend to find that if you give those albums a time a day, they are worth their ounce. They'll stick with you and they'll become your favorite albums if you're that way inclined uh if i don't mind i will take very quickly the next one and carter ford was not a fan mm -hmm. not my kind of thing okay. i understand the whole concept of it like the idea of having one person with like a revolving cast yeah i like that idea you can do that pretty metal dance i think i'll be classed as a metal band with a revolving revolving but I wasn't too keen on. Yeah. It's not my thing. Concept yeah. albums, as you did say, are very Marmite. They're hit and miss. They're niche. Yeah. The only one I can think of that does them well is Cumbria. 
I will. They're they're pretty consistent. They're pretty consistent with it. And honestly, I need more beer. I have no more to say on that album. You go for it and let those guys speak then. Yeah, to read the story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One thing I will say is that I think that. Don't use, don't, don't be using this as a, a gauge that I picked this up. <laughs> but I will say, for yourself and for people listening, uh, I think a really good album as a starting point for this band is The Human Equation. Um, very good album. Very good range of vocalists. Um, Dickie will probably agree with me then that the, the range of songs, there's a lot of memorable songs. And I mean, Looking across who's involved in that album, you have James Lebrie out of Dream Theater, Mikhail Ackerfeld out of Opeth, um, you have Heather Finley, Heather Devon, yeah, Heather Finley out of um, what do you call the Australian prog band? Ah, Google it. Um, but yes, no, as I was saying there, Kirker, that band as yep. a basis. To me, if you if you want a good a, a better example of a starting point to get into them, Human Equation is a pretty good example of that in terms of the range of vocalists. Again, it's it, it depends now. You know, if you can appreciate music that is more vocally driven than instrumentally, it is it'll probably not change your perception. But it, in terms of like, you know, you can get off on music that makes you go, oh, I want to sing. Then human equation is a good starting point. Uh, good range of vocalists there. Same as I'm one like, zero 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 one. I like that guy in the meme who sits at the desk and says, such and such and such changed my mind. So I'm yeah. that guy. So, yeah, yeah you're Stephen sure. Carter. <laughs> <laughs> so that's us all covered. That is. Well, I just want to say uh, quickly there with. The Transitus is the harder album to get into for Arion. Mm. I found it harder yeah, to yeah. get into Arion with that album than with the Human Equation with his other stuff. Uh, yeah. So I do understand the other guys' points of like they didn't really get it the first time. And the first time I listened to it, it was kind of like it was a bit overwhelming, just so much going on with the story. You're trying to listen to the story while listening to music and all. Uh, then it Found out there was actually a comic book to go, come out with it as well. So uh, it was, uh, but like the second listen through, though, I really started to highlight some of the songs. And there's at least six songs I found that uh, really liked, but there were, again, I, you have to kind of listen to all as one and then separate it between the, the story and the actual music from it because there's a lot of tracks that have story at the start of the track and it kind of ruins the experience of the song in a way yeah, but yeah. Uh, like get out i think it just goes straight into it yeah. and there's no story for it or there's a wee bit of talking but it goes straight into it whereas there's others there's like a minute of talking then it gets to the music part mm -hmm. so you kind of have to listen to the album all as one like straight through in order without breaking it up which uh for me sometimes it's not the best, like I'd rather just skip to the good tracks, which there's only a couple of tracks you can really do that with in this one, but 
Uh, Ariane as a whole, he's unbelievably talented. Uh, same with uh, his solo stuff and his Star One stuff. I love mm-hmm. them all. But you kind of have to know what you're getting yourself into when it comes to them. Because you really don't, unless you, you've heard other stuff. But, it's like you uh, have to have the yin, the yin with the yang. You have to have Yeah. Them. Yeah, like, it, he does... The sort of well, that album I think was one of the better storytelling albums. Like uh, Theory of Everything or the Human Equation, even I think that is That's the one of the best concept albums you can sort of get. Like it just the story's fairly straightforward and it's pretty amazing album. But whenever you come to Transitus, it was just sort of there's a lot to take in there. You can get a bit lost in it, but. Still thought it was a good album. I love the feature artists in it. D. Snyder again, highlight. I uh, I couldn't believe it when I first heard him, but uh, yeah, I, I enjoyed the album. Uh, but it, it's a lot to take in and sort of one sitting. Long story short, for anyone that's um, into the progressive rock, progressive metal, um, Human Equation is another one that's spread across two discs, but the whole gist of it is that spread across i think it's like decade i don't know if you remember it's like 28 days or 24 days or something like that it's but something like that. but it's meant to be spread across there's a guy in a car crash and he's in a coma and those days are spread across his coma so you're getting an insight into his emotions that he can hear internally and people that are in his hospital room and it's meant to be a story unfolds but it gets to the end and there's a surprise yeah but yeah it starts starts off with you hear the sound of car crash and then like sort of beeps of hospital and then it takes you through like an experience and journey of like what he's feeling uh his emotions like what he's hearing what he's thinking right the whole way love and all this yeah. yeah, it's done in a really good way, and uh, again, some of the feature artists are amazing in it, and uh, like each day is named a certain uh, day, so day 1 to 20, there's only 20 of them, but uh, it, it's, it's definitely worth a listen to. I'll, de- I'll definitely give another another shot, like, I mean, I'm not yeah. going to be prejudiced and just say, no, I don't like it, because I've heard, like, of it, or yeah. I didn't like part of it, so... I'm more than happy to listen to any two or three times a year. Just yeah. to get a, a proper idea. It might be that you need to go listen to some of his other stuff to kind of like sort of get what he's about and then sort of you can go into that knowing a bit more and it's like I can kind of understand a bit more of it because it did hit. There were some albums that I listened to from him and they were just, I don't really get it. But then you listen to more of his music albums and then you go back to the concept ones and you're like, yeah, it, it kind of makes a bit more sense, but that's just me. Like, so it might be different. I, I do, I do, I do appreciate this thought process and the people that he gets involved. Like that album he had. Um, oh my god, I can't believe I've forgotten the guitarist name. What do you call Kirker? You all know lead guitars uh, in Megadeth, in Rust in Peace, and Countdown to Extinction. Big in Japan now. Marty Freeman. Marty Freeman. He did a guitar solo on that album. There was Michael, Michael Romeo did an al- uh, guest guitar solo on one album. There was Paul Gilbert. No, he puts in big. He puts in big talent. Bruce but, Dickinson um, did. Uh, Bruce Dickinson uh, did through. Um, oh, Car- yeah, Car would tell you he was here. Can I point out yeah. for half, for half one in the morning and a dozen beers? That was fucking quick off my head. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was very quick. That was very quick. I'm impressed. I had a complete brain fart. So, so right now, here's the clincher. This may need everybody. Does anyone have a pen? Because I don't have one handy. Yep. Yes! Right, well, I'm going to let you decide who does a tally of these scores here. Well done. Good lad. Right, okay. Well, you can announce them. Right, so, well, so, Phil, we might need to edit this out. We'll just do, and like, a, a really work. dodgy edit. Uh, scores. Go ahead. So, we need, we need albums, so we'll have 
Orbit culture. Right. right. So we're going. What we'll do is to keep it consistent. We'll go across people. So we'll. I'll read out. I'll read out the people who could not be present. So okay, give me a list of the, give me a list of the bands first. Right. Okay. And then I can. So orbit culture was the first one you said. Yes. I will read them out to you. So. Yep. Here, I'll get the document up. All right, no. Tied in All there. good. Okay, folks. So our point rundown, we have Orbit Culture. Yep. We have Tides of Nebula. Yep. We have Earth Color. Yep. We have Deep Forest. Yep. We have Sean James. Yep. We have Soin. And we have Ariel. Okay, so I will tally up the scores as they come out. Yeah. So first of all, I'm gonna read out the top the top three for uh the guys that couldn't make it. So I'll go I'll start with Steve. Okay. So Steve ranked in th his third place was Soin. Okay. His second was Arion. Okay. And his first was Orbit Culture. Okay. Gary's were third was Orbit Culture. Yep. Second was Arion. Yep. And first was Soin. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> there you go. Very. There's, there's a bit of a similarity, but not. Consistency is key. Isn't it? So, yep. for the next one, I want you to read out what yours are and note them down then. Why? Well, I have a, I have a small question before I do yes. Can you nominate your own? Yeah. No. I, see I didn't think so. No, I didn't no. think so. No, because that, that would be the case that everyone just fucking three points for my choice. <laughs> So uh, fuck that. Well, for, for mine, for mine, in third place, I had um, Sean James. Good shit. Okay. Uh, so, second place. So I if you had... want, if you want to note what? down, if you want to note down one point for your third place, two points for your second place, and three for your first place. So that's the way we'll do the tally. Is that what you're doing? Right. Okay. okay. I should have known that from the start. My bad. Right. My bad for interrupting. <laughs> Um, right, I will ask. Can I have Gary's again, please? Mm-hmm. Okay. So Gary had let me see. Here. Orbit culture third. Uh yes, he had orbit culture third, carry on yep. second, and Swain first. Uh, do you need me to read Steve's out or are you good? No, I've got Steve's here. Sweet. And then I am just tying up as I go along. Um, okay, so, next is me. Do you want me to go next? You yeah. give us your run then. Okay. I have Sean James in third. Okay. I have, if you can give me a second. I have Earth Caller second. Okay. I know what your first is going to be. Well, what? do you know? What's my first going to be? Has to be Tides of Nebula, surely? It does indeed. Yep, Tides of ah. Nebula is first. So we'll move on to, after you've noted that then, we'll get Dickie's yep. top three. When you're ready, sir. Uh, so first is Soen, or Imperial. I don't even know how to pronounce it, but... Uh, Soin is first. So on. Uh, second is Tides of Nebula. And third is Arion with Transitus. Arion, third. Okay, Phil, on to you then, sir. Yep. Uh, 
Fifth caller. Uh, Mr. Gibson, Sr. My third was uh, Orbit Culture. Third, Orbit. And because yep. of consistency and gritty voice, Sean James in second. And your top dog? And my top dog was Arion because I can appreciate composition. Okay. Uh, we're missing somebody for seven cards. Yes, Carlos is unfortunately oh. didn't, didn't get uh, score no, uh, listen to all his. So we'll have to annex him from the rankings. He'll just Carlos. have to go to the bottom. Carlos. So, if you all chat amongst yourselves, I work at the scores. Yeah. So, obviously, then, Wild Kirker is compiling the scores, then. We'll have to suss out between ourselves and have a wee guess. We'll go along them. We'll have to guess who picked what and who correctly picked them. So, I, well, I, I um, know what I'm going to go for. for actually, I'll, just, I'll cast that right out now. Barber culture. Well, it, well, that's actually what I was going to say. I thought you were going to be my guess. So, there we go. Yeah, that's my guess. Yeah, I actually have it. I actually have it in a message as well. So, nobody else say, nobody else say who they were, what they were going for. But I'm also, so... Kirk, whenever you compile those scores, you let us know and we'll start doing the guessing. And yeah. we'll do all the guesses and then people disclose after their guesses have been noted down. And we'll okay. find out who was accurate. I have no idea about a lot of <laughs> This could be interesting. I've got a couple of ideas that are, I know for certain, like what cars is. Like uh -huh. if this. Uh -huh. Here. See, before we do the guesses, we'll let Kirker compile to see what I'll, what ranks the albums are in, just to see what way they're sitting. Yeah. I think that's fair. I'm heartbroken, my beard's almost gone. I think I need, well, I'm going for the double figures before bed. No, it, it looks quite cosy, that one. It looks quite compact, because this one, this one I've got, typically, if you fill it with more than three, if you lift it by the handle, it's quite difficult. You actually have to grip it, like a proper Viking hold, and... This. Yeah. Whenever we can finally go to the hill again, I'm bringing this with me. I'm going to be like, John, Phil. Phil, heart... <laughs> John, how much does this <laughs> completely fill cost? We haven't been to the hill in over a year. The last time I can actually tell for those two people that may be interested in watching, the last time we were at the hill was the start of February last year. There was us three and Dolly. And we left that night, and Dicky and Phil parted their ways one direction, and Dolly and I the other. And what can only be described as the monsoon of February was unleashed. I don't oh. know if you remember, completely drenched. Yeah. Yeah. Dolly, yeah, there's no guys walking. He's swimming home. Dolly, Dolly. Dolly was so soaked that it looked like he was wearing tinfoil trousers. His <laughs> jeans were shiny. I had never seen anything like that. Like, well, it was like they were reflecting like fluorescent light off the, the lamppost. It was, like, it was like so much liquid. Anyway, okay, um, okay, so I have scores if and when ready. Yep. Go for it. Go for it. It will be no surprise to anybody that Dave Forrest didn't get a single point. <laughs> Okay. I don't know. There's somebody who picked that get like some kind of like consolation prize. I think that should be a thing. I hope Do that so. for. I will say though, and it is it is very close at the top between three albums. There is 
no clear winner. There is joint winners the first time round. So in second place with seven points is Orbit Culture. And tied for first is Arion and Seal. Right, both so on, both on eight points. That's interesting. Both for all Tides of Nebula get? Tides of Nebula gets five. So it was third then, yeah? Um, Fourth. Joint third with Earth Color. Oh. Oh. oh, oh, oh. See, really I, I, live, I live for these cores. Yeah. I said, I don't know. Kind of See, this is what I'm hoping. The more of those people watch, they'll just like, like, I like that guy. I hope he wins. I don't know what the fuck he picked, but I hope he wins. Or um, be like, I don't like that guy. He's a knob. Yeah, That's that guy's a knob. I hope they all shit on his album. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so, now that we know the standing, the question is, who guessed what? So, now Gary didn't provide me with a guess for his, so unfortunately he'll not be able to get those additional points to find out what he's doing. A little, a, little, sorry, a little heads up here that if you want to be technical, yes, so on one because it was the only one that got two first places. Oh, interesting. Okay, if you want to go that way, it got two first places. It's the one that got there. Okay, right. Well, we'll go right. So we'll go based on these guesses. So, Kirk, you may need extra paper to note down people's guesses, and then at the end we'll disclose who picked what, and we'll see if those people get. It's three points for every correct guess. So oh, it's so exciting! Right, hold on. I'll write these in here. So. Sounds good. So I've written that Dickie first. Start guessing. That's something. <laughs> <laughs> Right, we're, we're going for the albums. Right. You, you name the albums and Dickie puts a guess. And you if you need back. a thumbnail, the look of confusion on his face would be the thumbnail for the it's, it's great. It is. That's exemplar. Orbit culture. Yeah. I'm going to have to say you. Okay. Uh, Actually, tides... hold on. Hold on. I need... Technically, I need more paper because I don't know if it's going to be this fucking long to write out. <laughs> well, I'm going to go to the toilet while... You take down the notes. You can move on to Phil, and then you can take your notes. I'll be one with it. I don't even know who else I need to guess for. Who else needs? Uh... Right, hold on. I need, I need to make a fucking, a, like a handwritten pie chart here, for fuck's sake. That, what you're saying? Is there... Yeah, I can just like, work my phone. Never mind fucking Excel spreadsheets. Are you ready? Are you drawing? Actually, I'm stuck between Tides and Nebula. I've got two people in mind. But one person, I actually have no idea what sort of music they listen to. So, I'm like... so... Mm. I've got over culture, so let's hear it. This is the convenience of the, this room being right beside the bathroom. Back in a flash, or on a, back in a flush. <laughs> right, so far away, if I'm in ready, Dickie, you're first on my list. Okay, so over culture, you. Tides of uh, Nebula. I'm gonna have to say is Dave. Okay. Uh, Earth Caller. 
Gary. Yep. So, um, Ryan. Gary on. Yep. Carl. And Sean James Phil. I, I definitely think I got the, a few of them wrong. Like that. Okay. Um, Ryan, you're next. Uh, you know what? I, I actually have the exact same guess as Dickie. That's what I've had. So, let me check that. Yeah. It's just copying me. No. Okay. Now, now, one thing I will add. I think that um, Deep Forest was Dickie. <laughs> Doesn't count. That, that, that suspicious light like, really affirms. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't me. <laughs> I like good music. He, he, he literally had an expression as if to say. Okay, right, Phil, you're next, sir. Orbiculture. Triangle on here. Uh, so on. Uh, the tides. Oh, Tides of Nebula. Well, that's ten, Tides of Nebula. Uh, carry on. Uh, Earth Caller. Sorry, I'm just going to let the cat out. Uh, yourself. Uh, Self ran reset yourself, ran and Dickie. You vote for yourself. Okay, um, Sean James. That is Ryan. Right, so for me, or, or, right, so for me, Arbiculture. That was definitely no hiding that. Uh, so on, I would have said Ryan. Tides and Nebda, I would have said yourself. As in Phil, not Ryan. Uh, Arion, I'm going with card all the way. First caller is Garrick. Has to be. Sean James is going to be Steve. And Dave Forrest is going to be Dickie. Okay. So the have loans we're missing is Gary, Steve, and Card. Card is exempt from this, I presume. Mm-hmm. Here I'll give you right before we before we disclose who picked what, I'll I'll read out what Steve's guesses were. Okay. Mm -hmm. So for Earth orbit culture, Steve had said uh, that was yourself, Kirker? Of course it was. Fucking never oh. met the guy who knows me and said out. <laughs> <laughs> Best buds. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, he believed the car was Arion. I don't know where he got that from. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is funny. Music wise, he said that Phil chose that tree music wank. <laughs> <laughs> he, was um, he, he believed that Gary was Celine. And okay. He believed that Dickie was Earth Caller. And he believed that uh, I picked Sean James. So we're going to use this as the basis of when we disclose who picked what. Okay. And then who was Gary's selections? Gary didn't give one. I, I said him over the message, but Gary only disclosed his top three. He didn't disclose his, his guess, his guesses. Okay. So unfortunately, Gary will be exempt from the guesses this time. Until okay. next time. So basically, so, we'll get five of the seven here. Yeah. So, um, so the third, question is, who recommended what? Yeah, exactly. So yeah. we'll go with Warbird Culture. And no, Black Warbird. no surprise. No surprise, I picked it. Everybody picked me. I can't do it. 
Yeah, so that's three points for practically everyone. <laughs> so. Right, who picked Soon? Sion? So on. Was that Ryan? That was Ryan. So who got that right? Me. So the people got it right is uh Yeah, me um Dicky. And um Me, Dicky. Right. Yep. Oh, it's only four of us, yeah. Just between yep. the, the character and disclose who he think, picked what, because you can maybe get four points here. Oh, sorry. No, I have no I right, Okay. Right, sorry. No apologies. Uh, right, who picked the Tides of Nebula? Hearts are not here. I believe that was either Gary or Steve. I am... Maybe I'm percent sure that was Steve then. Yeah, I think it was Steve because I'm maybe I'm pretty sure Gary picked that color. You know how I know? You know how I know? Did he tell you? No reason being is because earlier on Steve had said that he was saying there's a likelihood because of him getting up early tomorrow, he wouldn't be on. So oh, yeah. I I had said in passing that uh I said in passing that I I felt like I guessed practically everyone's guesses. Okay, yep. and I had said that I was pretty certain that he picked her a caller, and he says I was incorrect. Then that is Gary. Yeah. Gary picked her a caller. Yeah. Which, right. moves, which affirms what Steve picked, I think, but we'll know once so, Dickie and Phil disclose what they picked. Well, Dickie is our guess. Right. One. Dickie and Ryan, we want to take that Steve on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Else. So we'll have then Arion. I presume we're in agreement that's card. Yep. <laughs> it was. 100%. Of course it was. Card travel card traveled to Neverlands to see them. I think that's certain. Uh Earth Colour. We know now it's Gary. The only people who've got Gary is myself and Dickie. Who picked Sean James? Yeah. Yeah. Well, then without going any further, Dickie has a clean sweep of who picked who. <laughs> what? I still got no votes for my album, but I got all my guesses right. I know technically Dickie could maybe actually like be in a good position here with all those guesses. Oh, Dickie's one. Simple as. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But there went. There's one. There's one album left, and it's his own. <laughs> I think I picked it. I think I, I mean, Phil gets that right, and I think you did it too. Uh, actually, everybody except for Steve picked it. Yep. I. So, I Steve guessed it was Phil. Yep. He did indeed. Actually, hold on a second. You, who do you pick for Earth Color around yourself? I picked. Um, Gary, for a color. There was a tie. Oh. There was a tie between Ryan and Dickie. See, it's all about the name Ryan. The name, yeah. the yeah. name Ryan has strength. <clears throat> Ryan and Dickie are not the same name. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, I'm Ryan. <laughs> I just met the guy. That, that's why there's two. Literally just met the guy. How did you not know? Um, so basically, yep, yeah, Ryan and Ryan and Dickie have a clean sweep of the heat. I win it all. So that means Dickie, virtual high five. So what we need is for a, a live broadcast sack race to see who gets the victory. <laughs> the only issue with that comes with that I might like take it as like Punching my testicles across the floor as quick as I can. Well, you, just, you, you may admit the feet now, then. <laughs> yeah. So either that, or a social distance sacrifice. Like you can stand either side of the street and have a race. Well, we'll we'll meet at Northcott and. Uh, <laughs> 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 so, 
So as it stands, as, the it, stands. Last, as it stands, Carl won the last one. Me and Dickie drew this stands, one. It is, it is basically it is a tie. It is That's, a joint tie. It's the tie between Dickie and Ryan. Both got exactly the same as in a clean sweep of the board. Uh, I yeah, I was just thinking. I was just thinking. I came in third, sure. full fourth, Steve fifth, and the other two were technically exempt. Here, surely if I've got the points for Sawin being like the top joint uh, top album, no. does that not mean I'm first? <laughs> no, it didn't happen. No, forget about that. <laughs> it's not important. Yeah, yeah. I will look for next time to have like more paper and pens at my ready. No, same here. I, I should. I have the paper, but I realized the pen has disappeared. Um. Okay. So that is that is us for this no, session. Stop. There is one last thing to announce. There's one last thing, and Phil has the rights to do that. So. Mm-hmm. Please make fun. Someone really likes that album, then. <laughs> Are you sure they didn't submit twice? <laughs> <laughs> it's everyone has a burner. Everyone has a burner account. Okay. Okay. I actually heard that one. Mm hmm So we need I've heard I've heard of a band called Crystal Lake. I've never heard of a band called Crystal Lake. Crystal Lake's also an album by uh uh what do you call them? Um Was Crystal Lake not where fucking where Mike Myers was killed? No, uh, that's uh, Jason Voorhees. That was the the, the camp. That was ah, the camp that he cool. turned up. Camp Crystal Lake. There's oh, what do you call them? Celtic Frost have a band, an album called uh, Crystal Lake. Trivia. Um. So before then, before our next podcast, which will be next month, I could do this by monthly, to be honest. But I mean, sorry, bi weekly. Um. But. We may have other people, obviously, so I'm guessing you guys will be involved in the next one. Sure. Fingers crossed. No reason why not. Yeah, so um, I would say there's a likelihood Carl will probably be involved again. Well, maybe such at a better time that uh, we'll have a session that encompasses more people. Although, based on the length of time we got out of this one, Jesus. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, no one's watching this. <laughs> no, no. I'm more surprised that we got 20 views in the last one. So thank you for watching, everyone. Um, wow. Well so, yeah. So, uh, if, if really need be, I have an OnlyFans account, so I can like put up links if need to. I would totally pay to see your tits. Um, yeah. You see, pay me 20 quid, and I will stop sending you pictures. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, I'm looking forward to the next one. Um. Our topic isn't yet disclosed. They'll all get uh, sussed. We'll maybe get one or two. But uh, yeah, so we'll have more of the um, the album guessing game um, that came with the first two. And we're looking forward to more in the future. Hope you like watching. Actually, suggestions um, for a new podcast name is more than welcome. Yeah. Yes. And... Remember to, li remember to like and subscribe to this channel, by the way. Yeah. Do what he's in. Um, and also, podcast names besides SS, Potty McPodface uh, are welcome. 
Goodbye. Goodbye. So we'll leave